listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. You're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right. It's a big day here in the booth at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. Now, Stony Buds, how are we doing today? So good, my dog. <laughs> God, I love that. <laughs> so to my good. left, we got Jesse Bertner in the booth. Jesse, what up? how are we doing? Very good, my G. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is going to be a fun one, Jesse. I can't wait to get into it uh, with you and chop it up today. Should yeah, I'm time? hyped to be here. It's so awesome to be in this little snowboard culture paradise you guys have created. Thank you. Well, Congratulations. You are, you're a member of the Banter Hall of Fame from the trips we've been on, so let's let's solidify that today. But for those who are unfamiliar with who you are, uh, Jesse Bertner is a pro snowboarder that has done more for snowboarding than almost anyone I can think of. He's filmed over 20 video parts. He's created videos that have fostered countless careers. He's been a mentor to many, overcame a traumatic brain injury. He's a team manager for LibTech, dad, a husband, and he put Alaska, he put AK on his back, the AK kit. Let's talk about Alaska, first things first, and growing up there. Heck yeah, yeah. Yeah, where are you from? Uh, Anchorage, Alaska, just outside of the city, really, like um, 10 miles from the heart of the city, up in the mountains in a place uh, called Glen Alps. It's, it's part of Anchorage. Anchorage is like a huge geographical city, but I'm like up in the mountains, like above the Chugach State Park uh, entrance, and so um, that's where I grew up. Um, so you can see that that's how I got into snowboarding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. What is it with Alaskans and you guys like all stick together? It seems like I see you, Micah Hollinger, like er you guys are always like a pack. Dude, we really were. I mean, yeah, we were very much like a pack, a tribe. Um, I think just like early days snowboarding, uh, not, you know, skateboarding also in Alaska, like early scene, all that stuff. It's, it's like anywhere back in the day, like, like Ethan, you know, like everyone knew each other, but like imagine being in a place like Alaska where there's like way less people. And so you really know each other, you know, and then, and then when you, um, when you go out, you go out together and like, it really was, is like that and was like that. And like, we had an awesome, insane pack of Alaskan shred beasts that like, I am just one of many, you know, like, you're talking like Jason Borkstead, Lando, like, I mean, Cooley, like, we got, we had a hammer crew. <laughs> Some <laughs> like, Alaskan royalty right there. Yeah, like. Anchorage seems like a wild city, too. I was always, I've seen uh, the cop show in Anchorage, and it seems like a rough town. So I'm sure you guys all stuck together and yeah. focused on snowboarding to avoid all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of that, and we were also skating and doing skateboard videos at the same time as snowboard. And so, like, we were, and that's a very, like, I'm from, like, the, the hillside, which is more just, like, straight white, like, um, upper middle class. But, you know, Anchorage is actually a pretty multicultural place. And uh, there's, like, a lot of different uh, things that go down there that aren't affecting the hillside as much. And, uh, you know, skateboarding really tied those things together. So we were all, you know, very across, like, a very wide, like, um, social, economic, uh, Economic sounds right to me. Sounds <laughs> you sound intelligent. Sounds, I yeah, like yeah. It. <laughs> economic, uh, you know, uh, you know, just range, um, and that was cool. But yeah, so like I have friends that we, you know, grew up with that you know pro skaters or one at least Adrian Williams. So that's just so awesome, you know. So lucky to be from there and to have experienced that. Legendary. Well, what did the early days look like getting into snowboarding? I was watching old footage. Like, how did you get on? What was the first board company? Called? Big Alaska? Was that the? Yeah, that was actually the second sponsor I got. Yeah. I rode for Nitro for a second, which was really cool. Um, but then this these people up in Alaska, like, started a snowboard company, and they were like, I started doing contests and winning them, and, and they said, we'll fly you to nationals and pay for the whole thing. If you ride for our company, big Alaska boards, you know, and it was, uh, it was awesome. It was, um, Dennis and Kathy Sayer. Um, and Kathy was the DJ for K whale. 
which is the like hard rock station. <laughs> and so they owned the company and the boards were pressed at a uh, Kingpin in Minnesota. And so, and nationals was in Minnesota. So anyways, I, I had gotten on nitro through Andy Wolf. <laughs> the air horns is going to be ripping <laughs> at USSTC. And that was awesome. And, uh, and it was, you know, flowed a couple boards and it was sweet. And then, and I was like 15 or something. And, and then, um, then I got this chance to get flown to nationals and I took it and I rode for big Alaska on this kingpin board and, uh, it was amazing. Yeah. And I went, we flew into Minnesota and, uh, and we went straight to the kingpin factory and, um, and who did I meet at the kingpin factory? Chad Otterstrom. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he needs a. Yeah, I don't even think he would remember that at all. But and yeah. there was this kid Marty there who was like this bad boy club ripper young kid, and then Chad was like the, you know, the best. And then we all went to nationals, and it was actually like an insane nationals. Like Chad um, put something up recently, or Doran Laborn did, that showed like everyone that was in it and everyone that won their divisions, and it was just like you're looking at the next twenty years of snowboarding. What what resort in Minnesota do you remember? Giants Ridge. Oh, sick. Yeah. Crazy how that works. The people that are all focused on the contest are the next 20 years of snowboarding and yeah. end up being the industry and everything. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah. I mean, Sean White, you know, uh, Kier, Dylan, uh, John Summers, Borgie. Wow. Myself, okay. Doran, Chad. Like Chad, me, Sean White, uh, John Summers. I think we all won, like, your division, sixteen divisions. plus, yeah. yeah, fifteen plus, yeah. That's uh, one thing that's I got to highlight too. It's really interesting to hear because you know modern day Jesse, where where you've arrived with your snowboarding, a lot of you know one footed stuff like known for a lot of the stuff you guys are doing in Think Tank. But I want you to kind of paint a picture. The way you were coming up back then was through like catching air, big air contests, ripping the mountains in Alaska, stuff like that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, totally different style of riding. I would say the one thing that carries through is DIY. Like, because I said I grew up up in the mountains. Like, I, there was no lift. So I was just hiking and building jumps from the day I started. I was building jumps before I could turn. Months. Three months of just going straight and, like, hitting something. And, like, just surviving, you know? And then I, like, went to my mom one night and was like, I really need to learn to do this turning thing. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, okay, I sign you up for a lesson at Hilltop. And I got Air Tim McDaniels was my coach. And he uh, was a guy that would get pulled through the fur rendezvous behind a dog sled team on his snow, on oh, his wow. barfoot doing wheelies on a barfoot down the middle of Anchorage and with like a coonskin cap on. You know, like, <laughs> sounds like a champion. Yeah, it sounds like a real yeah. sick dude. So anyways, I learned to turn really quick that day. But anyways, yeah, so like – just jumps. Obviously, snowboarding was quite a bit different, but there was always jibbing and bonking and stuff too. But, but yeah, we were we were very much trying to do big tricks and and then you know trying to just trying to be Mac Dog for a long time, a really long time. I mean, Mac Dog was just setting the and standard, but that whole you know got got into snowboard videos really early, like. Really, snowboarding for me has been about the media. Like, I was like, I got a magazine, and I would look at the mag and then run outside and try to do what I saw because like, I was in the snow. So I'd be in my house and look at, like, John Boyer. John Boy, Boyer, or whatever. Boy, you know? boy Air, Boyer. <laughs> yeah, Boy Air, Boyer. Thank you. Sick nickname, Boy yeah, Air. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'd look at what his body looked like in the air, and then I'd run outside to, like, this little mound in my yard and just try to like get in the air but i was so funny you know like yeah we're talking progressions just slow back then mm -hmm. you know Real like, slow i can only imagine what that jump looked like too yeah too true huh? just oh yeah just horrifically but i didn't even have a shovel oh yeah no like just hilarious using but the it, tail of your board to throw something together but the whole time the mountains are like around me you know so eventually we started once my brother got into snowboarding, we started hiking up, just straight going up into the mountains, the Chugach Mountains. Just two kids, or maybe our friend Brett also, a few others. Maybe there's four or five of us, my friend Jeremiah, up in the mountains, just 
didn't know what we were doing. No one was talking about avalanches. No one was doing anything. It wasn't until later that my mom and dad caught a whiff of something like that, and they sent my brother to and I to a, like a three-day avalanche safety course at Hatcher's Pass. Um, just to like be like, hey, you guys are like going up and they didn't really, they weren't like backcountry skiers or anything. But I think some of their friends were and said, you got to get your kids knowing what's going on out there. Smart. Now, yeah, I, real smart. I got to ask real quick, just because I'm curious, like, sorry to derail a little bit, but the <laughs> Alaska is like, it's like a kind of a fishing town, right? Like, or I mean, sorry, Anchorage. I apologize. It's like, what's the, what did your parents do? What was the, I don't know why I'm kind of curious about that, but like, are, I just always picture everyone like coming from like fishing backgrounds. It's or something. a big Maybe city, that's, like, though. It's thing like a real city in Alaska. It is. It is the city. Yeah, the <laughs> only city, right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I guess I've been there. Yeah, it is a yeah. legitimate city. It's like half the population, but yeah, no, we are commercial fishermen. So yeah, I spent every summer in a little village town called Naknak, actually halfway between King Salmon and Naknak. For anyone out there from Bristol Bay. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so I commercial fished in the summer. And, and my parents were both school teachers, so that's how we got into commercial fishing was because my dad was teaching in Naknek, and his students were like, Mr. Burtner, like, we're, you know, we make all this money all summer. Like, his students were, like, running boats. They're killing it, and they're like, you should come fish with us. And one of his students, like, taught him the ropes, and then he started being a fisherman. And eventually just we were just fisher family. Cool. Yeah, I I was in my head somewhere, but I was like, in, I wasn't sure if that was the situation. Did yeah. he stop uh, teaching then? To he did, yeah, because the money was so good. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, the money was good. You work hard for that money, though. Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, I want to kind of change gears, and I know I know you're kind of um, an intellect. You like reading and things like that, and you you have a very great way of breaking down the fact that um, snowboarding is a form of communication. Do you want to dive right into that? Yeah, sure. Like, um, yeah, I think about this quite often. I should be able to put out a pretty good thought here, <laughs> but um, it's like uh, it's like what Corey Smith said at the beginning of his Neo Proto part. Like, snowboarding. What is it? Is it art? Is it sport? Is it you know a hobby? What is it? You know, that's very losing friends, losing girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keeps going. Yeah, sorry. Keep yeah, going. yeah. That's like very, you know that's very true. It's very much like this fluid thing that is like hard to define. And, uh, that's one of its real big strengths, but it's also sort of a weakness because we end up getting out into all these different camps. Like, is it skateboarding? Is it skiing? Is it surfing? You know, like, what is it? Well, you can kind of do it all. You can kind of do whatever you want with a snowboard. That's beautiful. That's awesome. It's like a great tool to express yourself. And, uh, at the end of the day, to me, what it is, is it's like a device for communication. It is a tool to express yourself. And so, like, it's very much like if you're using a snowboard, you're really communicating. It's another way of speaking. And if you're trying to do it for any sort of job or, or you know, make an impact on the snowboard industry, you're really in the business of communication. Um, and that's just a fun concept to think about. So, so let me see if I'm processing this right. So would you say that in a form of communication, like maybe somebody that's hitting like a big gnarly spot and they're snowboarding to metal is kind of like is communicating like a little bit more of like an aggressive kind of vibe. And then maybe somebody that's like hitting something smaller and getting tech is more playful. Is that kind of communication or do you want to, am I, am I kind of off target with your communicate, like how you just describe that? Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it, you know. Um, it's just like not – what I'm saying is that every part of it is is up for interpretation from as – a, as a part of yourself. So you, when you put it out – when you put a trick out, it's it's a piece of you, and it's not – it's not as – you can't quantify it, you know, as being, you know, like – you can't quantify it as being better or worse than someone else's communication. All of it is very individual. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it's, um, it's, it's very, it's, it's more like art and expression. Yeah. And you can even take it to the level of your clothing and your vibe you put out, I guess. Yeah, too, exactly. Huh? It's all part of it. You know, every thing you put on your body, every, it's all a signal. Even if you're just riding down the mountain, 
let's say you're like, I don't snowboard to communicate with anybody. Like I'm doing this for myself. It's like, yeah, but you're communicating to yourself like a freedom of spirit and fun. And, um, I just think that's cool that we're in the business of communicating. Mm -hmm. And then if you are trying to be like a pro or you got to think of it like, Oh, what am, what am I communicating? You know, what do I want to say? Wow. Never thought of that. I, yeah, that's a, that's a total uh, perspective shift. I like that. And the first person that comes to mind when you, when you say it is like Gus Engel, the way he's really communicating, like his, his own lane, you know? Yeah. And like, I don't, you know, well, Gus will tell at his bomb hole, but he, you know, he knew, he knew what he was, he knows what he's doing when he does it. You know, it's like a, a lot of the geniuses do, you know, like, like I hear stuff about Kurt Cobain and, and they have a plan. Like you see that they see the, the 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 it opening up, like how the creativity can open up into a, a future of like beautiful art, you know. And Gus very much saw that. Like we were talking about the stuff that he was doing, like we were discussing it before we would go and do it, you know. So good. Uh um, some of it's spontaneous, but yeah. we're also just like whiling out on the philosophy behind it, you know. Hundred percent, and well, well executed, and all those, and we'll we'll get back into that uh, at some point too. But that just brings me to something that I wanted to highlight, and it really stuck out to me at the time. Was I think it was a Think Tank ad, and I think it was in Thanks Brain, but it was a simple quote that said, "Concern over uh, criticism criticism clogs creativity." I want to just highlight that again: concern over criticism clogs creativity. Do you want to, I'm sure that was your brainchild or maybe it was Pika's, but do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, that's, um, I did write that one. Um, and then we had, uh, our friend Larry, Christina's really good friend, Larry, who was a professor at UW. He's the one that did the voice for that. And yeah, thanks for the air horn. Um, he was awesome as the professor for Think Bank and he actually passed away. So, um, RIP Larry, we love you. Uh, but yeah, no, that's uh, exactly so. Concern over criticism clogs creativity, I and mean, it's it's an alliteration, and <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but like everyone knows that, like every snowboarder knows that, and and people have said it in lots of different ways. Like the second you start caring what people are gonna think, you're like you're you're it's gonna slow you down. And I'm not saying you're you're done, but like. It's so hard to not show up to a spot and be like a guy and be like, what are they thinking about me? You know, but like, it's very hard. <laughs> like you have to like eat humble pie basically every time, but then you end up getting back to that place where you actually feel good about your snowboarding, but snowboarding in public like that, when you've kind of made a name for yourself is difficult unless you're just one of these like psychos, like Phil Hansen or something. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so like if you can keep that, if you can just not be too concerned over criticism, you're going to go to new places. Like you're going to do better. Like if you start buying into all that, like because chances are that's chances are the people aren't judging you, which is chances you know, are people are thinking about themselves. They're worried you're judging them. Yeah. And so like, you know, just yeah, empathy. But you know, it's it's really interesting stuff to talk about the ecosystem of snowboarding because it's like when people are left together, they tend to imitate each other, right? So we, when I look around at like a lot of the the broader scope of videos that comes out, it, it's like a lot of people that are just copying a lot of the same trends. And when I hear concern over criticism clogs creativity, it's like you see a lot of people staying in the same exact lane, the kind of like oh, friend, friend slash industry approved lane. Oh man, let's not. And, and, <laughs> and if you, if you, but if you can like concern over criticism clogs creativity, then you could step outside of that. Then yeah, yeah. But. Let's not like let's not have a monoculture, people. Yeah, let's have biodiversity. Like we got to have biodiversity. Like we do not need to all be cool in the same way. We need to be cool in radically different ways, and um, we need to look out for people that are like truly pushing an envelope that's going to like open something beautiful and new in the culture, you know? That's what made snowboarding rad in the first place. So we need to maintain that. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 And I think we do a good job. I think it's just a give and take. Like it just, it's just a cycle. So I think like it's totally rad too. When people come in and like rain things back that are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
this is kooky. Let's <laughs> rein it back. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, okay, okay, what are you doing? No, no, let's rule, rule, rule. Let's get it back in line. Okay, now let's break all those rules. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's healthy. That's just, and that's the way it's been going, you know, so I think we're, that's cool. All right, uh, Jesse, I heard a uh, kind of rumor that you are good at naming people's stances. <laughs> Regular, goofy. If you've met him one time, you probably got a good. We're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing a new segment of the show called Name That Stance. Uh, Name That Stance is presented by 686. Now, Buds, let's talk about 686. Let's do it. I heard you used to ride for him back I in the day. I actually used to be sponsored by 686. Now they're sponsoring the show? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's gone full circle. Mike West, who started 686, is a longtime snowboarder. Awesome dude. It was cool enough to sponsor me back in the day. And uh, he has maintained this company for years and years. And it's just an insane brand. They used to let Blotto and I, who also rode for them, design. Regular. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) He is regular. They used to let us design some of the gear. And I still see some of that stuff in the gear today. And they, uh, they're privately owned. Yeah, strong. that's huge. I think the fact that they're privately owned, we should highlight because it's owned by a snowboarder. Yeah. That's a huge snowboarder supporting snowboarders. Uh, they have a strong sustainability initiative. They're doing the work behind the scenes to really affect our climate footprint. So you got to slap some air horns on that. What else, buds? Slap some air horns on that, my friend. They also focus on carbon neutrality. We are a climate neutral certified brand, Mike West says, and uh, that's pretty cool. We need that in the clothing industry today. 686 is now going to be offering a small pants and shorts collection that is not just outerwear like they've offered in the past. It's going to be the kind of stuff you're going to be wearing every day for climbing, mountain biking, running on the trails, anything you're going to be doing outdoors. Support 686. They support us, and they are a great group of people. Let's do this. All right, let's get into... He. Name that stance, people. Well, first, you ever done a smelling salt? Woo. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I feel like I need a smelling salt right yeah, now. Yeah, you do. Here it is. Here it is. Buds, you need Oh, them? shit. Yeah. These are available at bombhole.com. I haven't done Here. anything. This is like still the closest I've come to doing drugs. <laughs> well, In your whole life? Well, other than Advil, which I pretty much In your whole life? life? In my whole life. Good man. Well, alcohol, but, you drink alcohol. Yeah, I do drink. I do drink. The uh, devil's sauce. Okay. Alcohol is a drug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, squeeze it. <coughs> Give it a little sniff. It's got to pop. S- It'll pop. It's a squeeze and sniff mentality. Okay. Whoa! He went deep. Oh. Let us know if that clears oh. the sinus for you. Yeah. Look at mine turned like red. Yeah. Oh, yours turned That's red too. Went. Oh. <sighs> All right. Okay. Yours turned Time- red. That's weird. Time for name that stance. Here we go. I'm about to break through a wall. Peter Line. Goofy. Ben Bogart. Regular. Dave Marks. Goofy. Victoria Jalous. Goofy. Jib Girl. Goofy. Jeremy Jones Big Mountain. Goofy. Jeremy Jones Goofy. Small Mountain. Who's fact checking this? I, these are all they're oh, all you correct. Have the I have them all. Ben Ferguson. Regular. Pete Sorry. Goofy. Mark Thompson. Regular. Ross Phillips. Goofy. Bina Bassler. Regular. <laughs> Gary Milton. Goofy. John Lang. Regular. Justin Meyer. Goofy. Damn, he's good. Pat Moore. Regular. Jeff Holes. Regular. Sean Lucy. Regular. Sean Black. Regular. Sean White. Regular. Alistair Schultz. Goofy. Rio Tahara. Regular. Wow. Jed Anderson. Goofy. Tara Dikitas. Goofy. Mike Yoshida. Regular. Wow. Pat McCarthy. Regular. John Cooley. Goofy. Jay Liska. Regular. Jay Liska, even. Is that true? Yep. Mark Frank Montoya. Goofy. Wow. Yeah, that one's... Uh, Pete Iverson. Regular. Alan Iverson. <laughs> <laughs> Practice! <laughs> that is correct. Damn, dude. Okay, last one. Yeah. I actually don't know the answer to, but Travis Scott. Travis Scott. There's it's a video there. of him snowboarding Alan? on the internet. Well, I don't know that, dude. <laughs> but there's a 50-50 chance. He has to, he has to have seen him once. What's yeah. the deal, though? I can't remember. I actually watched it, but I didn't write down a stance. So you, you don't away. even need to check those. I got them all right. You got those all right. So he did. Uh, That's incredible. That was pretty. That was a little bit of a lob list. Like that's you could, a lot to remember, though. You could yeah. go way deeper than that. really. Because I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. That that's unreal. So I mean, you, nice list. Though. What's the deal you. with it? You just have a great memory. Uh, well, the deal is um, actually like okay. Here's the deal. 
the deal is when I started snowboarding, uh, I went to the sporting goods store and they pushed me. Mm, they did the <laughs> and classic, I, which and foot I put, goes they said, what foot? Yeah. And I was like, I don't remember. My brother had a Burton performer 148, and that I had been snowboarding on that. And I didn't remember what foot was forward. And I was down in the city at the store and I needed to make the call. They pushed me and I put my left foot forward. They're like, you're regular. I get up to the house. I go out and I strap in and I try to snowboard and I just eat shit. And I'm like, oh, man. And I go back and I look at the performer and it's right foot forward. And I was like, no. And I told my mom and we went back to the store because, like, it wasn't, like, pre-drilled. And they switched it around. I came back up. I'm getting the last light of the day. I go goofy footed now and I go to snowboard and I eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm just not good at this, but now I'll be this way because I'm like embarrassed, you know? So I was goofy, but it like made me think about stance a lot. And then like there was a group of uh, boarders back in the day in the mag that were like all about being like regular footers. It was like yeah. some joke that yeah. Andy Hetzel was doing. And, uh, it's like yeah. the regular foot army or something. Yeah, exactly. ARA, I don't remember what. <laughs> exactly, was, yeah. Um, so, and I was like, kind of like, took it seriously. <laughs> so I was always looking for goofy footers. <laughs> like everywhere, I'm, goofy footers are cool. Well, you it know? is. It, you got, it's more rare. Yeah. If you were to look bit. at that list, if you were to look at that list we just did, it's definitely significantly less goofy footers than regulars. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I... I started snowboarding first and then like two years later I started skating and I was just like, I go this way and I go regular on a skateboard. So then all of a sudden I'm very much like thinking about it because I'm doing both. So which way like, do you like my buddy Chris here. I do that as well, all three of us. So we're oh, oh it's a three pack. <laughs> three packs of core. Three packs of core right there. So who else? Name a couple of others. That do that? UC Oxenin. Latex Mansion, Jet Anderson. Yeah. Oh. That's right. He does. Do you think Eka we Baxton? all just started uh, riding Maybe wrong? someone you heard of named Travis Rice. Oh, T. Ricky? Yep. Ricky. Surfs, regs. Uh, another one, Sage Kotzenberg, Colonel Kotz. Do you oh, think wow. we all just started riding our shit wrong? And then skateboarding I mean, he straight. sounds like he got his. Yeah, I got mine backed up. Like, I got evidence there that kind of shows that, yeah, yeah, I started riding it wrong. Yeah. That's crazy. Who knows? But, um, but yeah, I don't, uh, Honey Bear don't surf. <laughs> which way do you which way do you fingerboard fingerboard regs oh, okay. I mean, everyone <laughs> fingerboards <laughs> regs, you know? That's so, huge. so what i was wondering uh this is did you ever watch the epically latered with brian anderson i think and he's like he basically has like a mirror set up and he's like watching he's like this is so i can watch my favorite goofy footer parts like in the regular or whatever or by maybe by what first. yeah <laughs> that's, yeah, that's next level yeah dude. he would like set up a mirror and watch like his favorite per like skaters in the other stance so those the same as him i can't remember i think it was brian anderson but that's crazy. oh I, was, my God. I feel like that's like right up your alley no i love i love me some regular footers too. yeah you do yeah like okay. i just like uh knowing for some reason it's like yep. i guess my one piece of ocd because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like not I'm pretty right brain Well in the words of Ace Ventura He's good with my help He could be the best <laughs> but I'm good at I'm good at two things <laughs> yeah. Knowing people's stance And tramp skating <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about the pedal For those that don't know Oh yeah There's a There's a Yeah just break that down Oh well the, the Yankee The Yankee peddler <laughs> Is a Is a well known Tramp skate phenom Austin Granger Uh <laughs> These guys, really good buddy, who's my buddy too, and uh, it's a way he would do kickflips on the trampoline and stuff. Is he would just go up on the tramp skate and get above it, and then just look like he's on a bicycle, like <laughs> just starts like <laughs> pedaling, and the board's flipping under him, you know. And, like, uh, <laughs> and then there's like this restaurant. It's a restaurant, right? Yeah, <laughs> out in Massachusetts, the called Peddler. the Yankee Peddler. <laughs> <laughs> so we just call Granger the Yankee peddler. <laughs> and for a sidebar, like a good kickflip, you want your foot to go out and flick. His 
went straight down. Straight it was a pedal. Yeah. He just flicks it straight. <laughs> and side sidebar <laughs> on the trampoline, <laughs> there is really no such thing as a good kickflip. <laughs> <laughs> so like I'm like, we're all pedaling out there a little <laughs> bit, dude. Let's not be <laughs> Yeah, does he do the style when he's actually skateboarding? Uh he doesn't uh, no, he doesn't skate he's, that well, much. No. He's more just a more of a Nolly Trey guy. Yeah, he's really. kind of a Nolly Trey god. So right. that brings me back to some more jargon here, because I'd like you to break down the difference between a stance and a stance mm. while we're talking about stances. <laughs> yeah, well, like a stance is just a stance. Like maybe you're regular, maybe you're goofy, maybe it's 24, maybe it's 22 and a half, maybe 21, you know, but then you see the occasional person go by and you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> Stance, <laughs> you know, and that, I think stance is usually pretty wide, <laughs> like to really wide. That thing is a stance. <laughs> yeah, like a, like Sean White's running a stance, stance. dude. Like you're just like, whoa, <laughs> like uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, love it. What about the term um, ball candy? Oh, ball candy is uh, a fun one because it's very <laughs> random. But uh, so, like, oh, Jesus. So Scott Stevens always wore skull candies. He's so funny because I don't even think he sponsored by them back then. But like, he just would run them, and he got them on the always on. We we called them like scandies. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then uh, Andreas Wig, <laughs> we like had this shot in this movie where he like throws snow up in the air and like holds his pants open and like catches the snowball in his pants he's like got his shirt off or something and like we would always just like do that <laughs> but, like, and we called it uh we called it ball candy <laughs> if you watch like um thanks brain you can see some references in yeah there. yeah so it's some sort of like amalgamation of skull candies and this andreas wig life either like <laughs> Came to be this just thing. became a thing. <laughs> we just like did all the time, you know. Well, sidebar: Stevens would also ride with Skull Candies, and they would not be plugged into any music <laughs> no, device. Oh, he was just <laughs> yeah. running them for style. Yeah, <laughs> style candies. <Yeah>. Side sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sidebars going down. Did uh, Did Seth Hewitt do the smelling salts? Because that's another one. Is a set sniff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you get him so on good. here doing a Seth sniff with the smelling salts, that might be like <laughs> oh too god, much. Make that happen. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, the Seth sniff is what cheers or which one is it? I think what so. I don't remember, but yeah. Break that one down. Oh, it's just it's just another you just pull something from a snowboard video and you just like obsess over it. Just like you would from any movie, like from Zoolander or something, and then you just like run it forever. And so like we, there's this like horrible lifestyle <laughs> where you like be, <laughs> just destroys himself it's really scary but like they're like filming him after he like eats it and he's like down by this rail and he's like, <laughs> like does this sniff and we just all started doing that and like yo mike yoshida obviously like he gets a hold of something man he runs with it dude he's a running back <laughs> yosh is the running back dude oh all right speaking of yosh what is the all-time most quoted regular movie on a snowboard trip what would you say most all time quoted regular movie, not oh, not snowboard movie. I was trying to work Verger in there somehow. Verger, <laughs> <laughs> that's a Bjorn Linus from uh, yeah. T. Ricky's. I think it would actually be probably um, for Yosh and I. It's forty year old virgin. Okay, yeah, Verger. I thought it was going to be a uh, McGruber. Oh, McGruber. <laughs> uh, well, groups too. I mean, dude, that's a tough one, man. You're really putting me on my heels here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about what you were just breaking down there about finding a snowboard video and just really leaning into like the quotes or the thing, picking up on it, making a joke of it. Like back in the day, break down how you used to get videos and get your hands on it. Oh my God, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, when you didn't have a lot of media, like everything was a jewel, you know, it was so important. And so then, and then like you wanted to know these people. And so like anything they like said or did, you like, you like laughed at or like thought it was whack, but you like talked about it like constantly with each other. So like you really like brought that to life. Like, like, um, gotta be the first ones for me is gotta be Nick Parada in critical condition when he's when he's retelling the story of him ragdolling into those rocks uh which is a psycho shot 
And that was actually in Totally Bored, I think. Maybe. I think you're right. And then, but in Critical Condition, he's like driving the car and he's like, yeah, like, like, you know, this rag on the rocks, like, you know, stitches here, stitches there. And then he like swings over to the camera. He's all memory loss. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's wearing a mambo sack. <laughs> yeah, he's got a dreads pushed up in a mambo sock. And so we would always memory just be loss. like, memory loss. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> side sidebar, I was doing that on the East Coast at the same time. <laughs> nice, dude. Nice. Yeah, so that it's one. I mean, thing. dude, Critical Condition had some great ones like uh, "Zig When I Should Have Zagged." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's Chris Roach, you know, like "Zig When I Should Have Zagged." You know, um, there's so many good ones like "Call Nine One One." This phone has no eleven. Like that's a <laughs> that's a quote from Critical Condition. Anyways, like you know what I'm, you know, and they're different movies for different people. You know, like where are the kids getting them from now? True, that's a good question. Kids these days. Yeah, back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's get back on uh, Bertner's uh, rise to the top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but so I think it's right now. I <laughs> made it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're cruising along. We're in AK, <coughs> dude. Those big Alaska boards. I saw the photos. I love the graphic. Those things are sick. You're getting you're getting sponsored. You just went to nationals. How does uh? What is what is starting to like really film and really like career taking off look like? Well, right then it was like, oh, this is easy. Like I literally just won every contest I entered, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like at Valdez as a high school kid at King of the Hill, and like um, I'm gonna blow his name. Got it, Mark Gallup. He's like. Let's go shoot photos. And we're, me and my friends are like out in Valdez shooting photos. We're, you know, I'm 16 and we, you know, we sh we're shooting photos with Mark Gallup. We get like the cover of Outside Kids magazine. <laughs> Derek Liska's <laughs> jumping over us. Uh, we have all these pictures in there. And then uh, I like go to Alyeska that spring and do a 360 off a of cat track and. Some people hit me up and like, you're on the cover of GQ magazine. Like literally like 360 over a, a photographer I didn't even know was there. <laughs> like this is like, how much easier could it be? Like this is going to be so easy. I'm going to be this big pro snowboarder. And it's like really funny because that plays into sort of the next step of things, which was like that was all falling into place so easily and then from there for a while it was quite a bit more difficult <laughs> <laughs> well you say gq or the GQ. gq gq london which is a gigantic publication like i have like this cover of me like with like the dragon hisses on and my hair is yellow and i'm like back three and off a cat track just straight over guy in the sky you had no idea he was down there huh no these uh, my buddies were were shooting some clothing for the gq like snowboard clothing special something and they were all like down there but it's just a hit we hit it's called um south edge and um south face i guess and i just went and there was a guy under me that's dope <laughs> that's like kind of you know a good example of what it felt like mm -hmm. like yeah you did a 360 and then you get the cover of a magazine like five months later of course so so then when when did it get hard? How did what did that look like? Uh well then I moved down to Washington and um and then that wasn't exactly hard, but I had to break into the baker scene and that was cool and a, a learning curve that took a couple seasons before I felt like I was even really riding the mountain. I was just kind of scratching the first the surface for one season and then really had to fall in with the right people to really experience it. And just the next step, you know, in snowboarding was quite a bit uh, larger, and and uh, I had to I had to eat humble pie a few times, which is really something that I learned is that everybody that's doing anything in snowboarding is working hard for it, and you got to respect everyone's hustle because if you see someone in a just because you see someone in a movie or a mag, you're like I could do that doesn't mean you could do that because there's other things they had to do to get there and they're, they're social or they're 
it's the getting up in the morning or the being at the right place at the right time and just putting in the work and putting in the days and meeting the people and like just because you can do a a fakey five that looks pretty good just you know doesn't mean you're gonna get in there with the guy that can do the fakey five you know and like i learned that you know the big one was when whitey came up to alaska and they came to camp and borderline camp and mikey and mikey's first big kind of big movie i would say would be brown trout um so yeah like i was out there with those guys hitting the jumps with them and i was like i'm doing what they're doing and like and whitey's filming and like mikey's you know these guys are doing the tricks i'm doing the tricks and like i'm gonna be in the movie and you know like i just like put all this together in my head and then literally like bought the movie at the store thinking i was gonna be in it went home put it in was not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> not even in the credits. Was huh? <laughs> literally surprised and pissed off. It's crazy that that was my mentality. You know, I'm not like that guy. I wasn't like some bratty kid. You yeah. Know? But like, I was still on that track of thinking, like, yeah, you just go rip and you, because I got the cover of GQ by doing, you know, like it was easy, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. But like, no, it wasn't. There was other things I had to learn, and so. And then, you know, on some of those things, I never really did learn. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> that's why I just started making the movies. <clears throat> that's, yeah, that's great. So that's, Whitey was pretty picky and choosy about who was going in his movies, too. So I could see that being a being a thing and you not making it in. Some crews might have popped you in, though. Yeah, I mean, I was getting into little movies here and there back yeah. in the 90s, you know. But, like, yeah, like, Whitey was awesome. He was great. And, um and he did help me and put me in some, got me in some magazines and stuff d later on. He used to shoot with a rig where he had his video camera and his photo camera on one rig and did both at once, which is pretty sick. Yeah. Yeah. He was fun to be around and hear tell stories and stuff and like just awesome. So how did the first video part start? Oh, high school. Um, um, was in a, a high school, a school within a school where I was able to, uh, do some independent studies and uh, we did snowboard video as one of ours and we made a movie called broadcast and it was uh, it was like me and the homies like the high school homies and and actually Borgstead too and like yeah Pete Iverson what we did it was broadcast how I learned to love the tube which is a play off of um, Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Love the Bomb, which is a cult classic movie. Um, and uh, so we like had all this found m media that we got off TV and everyone kind of like cut their part with like some sort of like media from television. So it was sort of this like brainwashy. It was, it, we were in a philosophy high school, so we were making a philosophy snowboard movie, which very much like was ended up what I ended up doing for forever. But, um, that was cool. Yeah. I made that with my buddies and, um, and then Jason, we had a premiere actually right before borderline camp and Jason Borkstead came to the premiere cause he had a part and after it was, he was making his homie movies. And so we were like, yo, we should collab. And that was how, like, the first idea of J.B. Deuce was born. J.B. Deuce, you know how they came up with the name J.B. Deuce, Easton? Uh, Borgstead and his name put together? Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> right. right? I don't know. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, I you got that. it, dude. Do we got a prize Boom. pack? We got a prize <laughs> pack for butts? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Gonna get you a, a Steezin for no reason DVD. Yes, <laughs> those are some cult. Those are some cult classics, dude. Those are those are heavy. That's a good name too, Steezin for no reason. I was more of a survival of the tightest guy myself, but you know, teach their own. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good name too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we came up with some really fun ones. Uh, that and that one's was really cool because it seemed like you guys brought the like Alaska. You put Alaska on your back, where you have, you know, Adrian Williams and and Hollinger skating mixed with all the OG Alaskan snowboard homies too. And absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, God, it was so fun to be there for that. And that kind of like really 
decided where I was going to go. Like, there was a time in my life where I was like, am I going to be a skater? Like, really go for it? And uh, I think we've all been there, but um, I was, I didn't have the chops to do that really. And I chose snowboarding. And then it became a thing where I was like, I'm going to be the filmer for the skaters. And that was really cool. And it was so fun to be there for Adrian and Micah at the beginning, at the very beginning of it. And it was really cool to see uh, and be a part of and help them get going. And then once they got going, especially Micah um, set a bar so high for everybody else and it it carried over into snowboarding like the bar he was setting like was crazy like he was doing amazing stuff and he was doing it with like this micah style and it was like so sick you know it's really interesting talking to micah he described it as like living in alaska around that time is like he's like yeah jesse would leave for the winter and it would get like kind of dark and depressing and we'd all kind of like get depressed and then he come back and then like we'd start filming skating again and then life would be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's tough in Alaska for a skater and like, yeah, they would just kind of like, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of skating going on, but they were like breaking into schools and churches and stuff to like get their skating done. You know, they were definitely the snowboarders were like the snow country club members, you know, <laughs> like that's what a snowboarder kind of is, you know, like, the buddy owns the house in Girdwood and we all go off to the country club for the weekend, and, <laughs> you know, get our bread bowls and like, <laughs> who's going to throw a backflip, you know, like, <laughs> and then like skaters the skaters are, are like, the it's like that movie kids are like gummo. You yeah. Know? They're like, they're like down in the town. Like, and it's like, I don't know. It was a different scene for sure. A little but, more urban, very urban. Yeah, yeah. We were in both. I was in both of it, but like, I definitely, couldn't hang with the after hours of the skate scene usually. So you, you and Borgestad were making uh, these JB Deuce videos, which were classics and somewhere along somewhere in those, you took a pretty good tumble and uh, smacked your head. Do you want to break that down? Yeah. Yeah. We can go into the old brain injury. Um, yeah. I just, uh, we were, it was well, I guess we had already, we, it was for in for life. Um, we were done filming it, though. So the clip didn't go in until season for no reason. After in for life, we were done editing it, and um, my buddies were going to just jib this rail, uh, get some ice rink snow, you know, we're going to go Tech 9 style. You were going ice rink on them? Ice rink on them, yeah. And actually... Um, Matt Edgars and his friends, they were going to do this fun rail in Kirkland, and it was cool. And uh, I just didn't take it seriously enough. And I can, like, seriously, like, think back to a couple of my bad rail moments, and it almost is like on the end run, I can remember not taking it seriously enough it's almost like uh, concern over criticism clogs creativity in a way like i was like i remember coming in to, i just did a board slide but like i just remember coming in like this is kind of beneath me oh really yeah wow. like this isn't enough of a thing i'm not actually getting a clip here i'm just out with the homie like you know and it but it was enough of a thing <laughs> like i was board sliding and just slipped off and the stairs were dry and I caught and my tail hooked the support and it whipped me back and my head hit the last step. Damn. And it was just, uh, you know, pretty crazy. Yeah. And really crazy for Christina and very traumatic. And it, you know, took a long time to really get back, like to a sort of stable place, um, in my life. It was pretty, tough but you know it didn't really slow me down that much but it definitely like changed everything yeah so and what did the doctor tell you the doctor said you know the doctor said that i was good to go to snowboard again if i wore a helmet and so that's you after know. you healed up and everything right yeah i mean you have a gnarly scar i mean it must have been a longer pretty long downtime process as well it was but it was really more like a brain fog and i lost my sense of smell uh for a couple of years 
but um, the brain fog was really intense for maybe a couple months, three months, maybe. Just like slow down a little bit, it like slowed down, super tired, pretty darn depressed, really, kind of just flat, yeah. dull, 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 just a dull human, a dull version of myself, and, and um, just kind of broken, and and I just sort of came out of it slowly, and and kind of like the smell too. It's not like it came back. It just sort of like is sort of more there every day, you know? It's not like a moment. So just, um, but I was definitely, definitely so hyped when the doctor said I could snowboard again because, um, yeah, I wasn't done, you know, but. Did it make you change your approach? Yeah, it totally did. And and, um, and it, it took the course of a few years for it to really come together. But it definitely made me change my approach. The first thing I did is I promised Christine I would never do anything where I could die again on my snowboard. So right there I set like that first parameter that was like, okay, like, like I've never done the Baker road gap. Like I'm not saying you're going to die doing the Baker road gap, but you could die doing the Baker road gap if you really, really, really screw up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, and so I just, I hadn't done it at that point. I was I'd done the cat track cap, and so then at that moment I was like, I'm not gonna do it. it. Just just I had to pick something in my head that was like, okay, what could you die doing? Like, okay, I'm not gonna do that, and something like that. I'm not gonna do that anymore. So I just decided to change my snowboarding in that way because we had just gotten married like a few months before I hit my head, so that was a pretty heavy wedding present, you know. We did our honeymoon in Italy, and I was kind of like height of brain fog. Yeah, just hardly there for her, huh? That's hard on Pika. Yeah, very hard on Pika. Super hard. And she was there when you did it, right? Is that what you said? She wasn't with me at uh, the moment, but she met me at the hospital, and it was crazy. Yeah, it had like, to be. She kind of needs a super air horn. Oh, super air horn, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. The ultimate respect <laughs> from the bomb hole. Yeah, no. Yeah, that was scary. Jeno and and Andy Simitis were there, and um, and they took care of me and got me got me into the hospital. And when I got to the hospital, I was just like, I, my brain was like exploding, and I <laughs> just went to the front and I'm like, and they're like, fill out a form or something. And I just like threw my body up on the counter and just screamed like, help me. Damn. <laughs> like, like I just remember throwing my chest and, like, stomach up on the counter and, like, laying my arms out. And they were just like, okay, get this guy in the back. And then I'm like, oh, can I, you know, close my eyes or whatever? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and I just don't remember anything for a few days. Crazy you remember that part. Yeah. Yeah, I was in, like, a weird fugue state. I would call it, like, alien aliens visiting your brain type yeah. scenario, you know. And then they obviously did surgery from your scar, huh? Yeah, they had to open up my skull twice, drain it, and Move then... Move the piece, put it back on. Yeah, after. twice of that, and um, it, it all went good. And then you kind of, maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like you were a bit of a helmet advocate after that point. Yeah, that was, you know, part of the agreement with myself. And I don't know if my family was involved in the agreement, but I told myself that that was an agreement I'm making with my family I think if maybe they were involved it would have been (laughs) do something else completely (laughs) (laughs) but um but I was like okay I'm you know making this I'm gonna wear a helmet you know and just do it just take it you know and just make it no questions asked helmet goes on the head and uh that was easy super easy and you know I think Duffacy was already wearing one right then. Mm-hmm. Good company. Like they're still rare though. Still rare. Yeah. Sure. Still still very much a a decision, a choice that people don't seem to be choosing. Mm-mm. Have you, had you been wearing a helmet, would it have helped? A hundred percent. Because it seems like those hundred percent. It head. was like a slow motion dork crash. Yeah. So it would have protected you've been Yeah. Fine. No, I would have been like is it a difference between like like, God, I need to wake up today. Or, like, 
oh, dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> night and day difference, you know. That's interesting to just kind of highlight the career too because we kind of skimmed over. What point were you doing like the big air contest, like triple crown and all that? Because like, you, did you win a Vans triple crown or yeah, win a big I air did. contest? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Let's talk about that, yeah. dude. That, we can't skim that's, over that's that. Heavy. Let's that's dust heavy off the trusty fakie 900. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all did contests all together, and it was amazing. And the Vance Triple Crown Series was amazing for that because everyone did it. The deal was, the deal was you paid like 170 bucks, I want to say. You were in the contest. You got lift tickets for one week. You got a food voucher every day and you got, and there was parties at night with food and like drinks and stuff. So like you were just like, this is the cheapest snowboard trip we're going to go on. Let's all go to the van strip, <laughs> you know? And so like we would roll in mass to these and just, and like Chuck and try to win and stuff. And it was super fun. And I ended up uh, getting lucky and winning one. And it was insane because I beat Jim Rippey. He got second, which was crazy. Dude. Heavy. That's very heavy. I mean, he was, like, deep in his career. But he like, was dominating back then. To be up though. there with Jim Rippey, you know? Like, yeah. And I, I've had some super fun mix-ups in the Vans Triple Crown with, like, people, like, you know, like, we would do border crosses. Like, did you ever do border crosses? Uh, I've done a couple when I was a kid, but not, not like that. No. Yeah, like, where everyone's doing it. Like, yeah. Travis Parker's doing it. Like, you know, like, Terrier's up there. Sean Palmer. Um, Hetzel, like Jamie Lynn's doing it, you know, like everyone and and your buddies. <laughs> it's like you know, like I got Hetzel ran over my head, you know. That's like <laughs> <laughs> that's like my claim to fame. Yeah, that's wow. a claim. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, yeah, like it's just an awesome. That was awesome, you know. Like we and contests were really fun like that, and it brought everyone together. So I got I got lucky and got to win win one of them. I, I did pretty good. I would like sometimes qualify first. And then like choke in the contest, but fakie nine, the big earner, big move. Cat, yeah. Can I say cab? Should we? Yeah, we can debate that. <laughs> Somebody will be mad about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's just not even get into that. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> it's switch front side. Oh, I, oh, of, I, I don't mean, do that though. Yeah, because switch I, front side just takes too long to say. I don't do that because then you have to switch all the grabs. Mm, okay. Oh, yeah. So I say fakie. Okay, there it is. <laughs> yeah, fakey nine, you know, was a, was the was the hit off the toes. I did like fakey nine. Back then, weren't they? Didn't everyone just call them cab nines back yeah. then? Yeah, yeah. Ha- jalapeno toe popper. Jalapeno toe popper. Wow. I did melon to stale fish, Woo! and I, I think the reason I won it wasn't a very big jump. Two like, grabs. I took it to like the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And Deep then fish. I did a ten eighty actually, and I landed it and reverted, and that was like. You had a ten eighty under your belt in that contest. I did a. Woo! Fakey 1080. I want to say cab. I want to say cab. Back, <laughs> back then, cab was the word. I don't know yeah. when it, who changed Back it. then, you grab tail checks in the mail. Is what oh, they what? Say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 1080. That's dude. Borgie again, dude. <laughs> back, back nine, nine tail? tail back How many checks tail. did he cash in the back nine tail? Dude, so many. And Borgie was so just like. Yeah, blazing trail for us. He was winning contests in Mac Dog. Yeah, he like, was killing it. Killing it. Dude. He's got he a was, shop now, right? In Alaska? Yeah. You guys got to get him on here. Yeah. Hit him with Let's a big get on here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so, yeah, the uh, that was cool. Yeah, I got to win a couple contests. It felt good. So, you went contest, and then you're doing uh, JB Deuce. You smack your dome, and then you're kind of shuffling around, finding your new lane. And what did that look like, and what did you settle into? Yeah, so shuffling around, finding the lane. Um, I think we were just chasing Mac Dog still and just trying to, like, you know, go big and and be as good as those guys. <coughs> and and Steezing for no reason, though, was really, like, such an experimental idea that we wanted to, like, wear all this funny clothing. And, like, and so I think in that one it was, like, the first sort of, like, oh, like, get weird you know and that was sort of um started started spinning the wheels and then when think tank started though um i was sort of like half in because i also coolie had got me a job working for mikey for love hate so and this is all part of like 
coming off of my brain injury really was like, what am I doing? You know, is it working? And sponsor stuff wasn't working out. So I was just kind of like, I need money. And Cooley was awesome. And like, you know, gave me this opportunity and I was like, I'm going to do this, you know? And, um, so Thunk Year was actually filming Love, Hate and Genevieve really was driving a ton of the missions behind Thunk and like, and the art direction and stuff. So he really was like pushing that project through the winter. And then I came in for the edit and also I'm filming on the side and Cooley was really enabling me to be this like filmer snowboarder. And, uh, he really like protected me from uh, like, <laughs> he helped me out in that way. Cause he knew that I still had a lot and I didn't really know what I had until it was going away kind of. Because the difference between Steezen and Thunk was pretty big. Like, Thunk is, you know, maybe my best jumping year ever. If not, you know, Cue the Birds maybe is in is right in there. But, like, yeah, and it was, like, that energy of, like, whoa, I'm a filmer now? Wait a second. I don't know if I am, you know. And Jeno and I would always talk about this. They were like, why do we have to be one thing? Like, why can't we be, like, the creators and the doers, you know, and like Jamie Thomas, <laughs> like, you know, he owns the company and he's got the last part, you know, like let's do that. You know, like you can be multiple things, <laughs> but that wasn't really something that was going on at that time in snowboarding. Great point. couple things want to highlight there, like to bring that exactly what you're talking about. If you look at your jump clips, in thunk they have the same color settings as love hate and i remember seeing that and being like why does that look like <laughs> why does that look like love hate footage for burtner's clips and it is <laughs> because they were filming you basically hit the jump right with exactly yeah settings. yeah cooley and and i would say mitch mm -hmm. were the ones that filmed me the most and i'd like to give an air horn to mitch yep uh because i don't hang out with him at all but i we had a really great year together and he's an awesome dude and um, I'll never forget this trip to New York where, where we, like, stayed up. We pulled an all-nighter just for him to front board his first kink rail. And it didn't make the movie, but we got the clip. Oh, no way. Damn. And it was, like, really cool. Because I think even when we were doing it, it was, like, we did a huge day. And then, like, um, did this huge day, big night. And then came back to the hotel. We dropped everyone off except Ami, line and me and Mitch. And we were just like, Mitch, let's get this. And he's like, I want it. And he's like, I don't even think it'll make the movie. I'm like, doesn't matter. Let's go. You know, wow. and we like went and got it like right in the, like five in the morning or something. And, and then we all went to the airport. Amazing. I would say um, also going back to Thunk, that might be, that's probably my favorite part of yours. The, the song, the like, the balloons, the energy, that video. We, we had Thunk on, on repeat. Love that one. Cab nine stiffy. <laughs> yeah. Stony <laughs> baloney. Stony yeah. baloney. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that, yeah, it was a good, that was a good year. Um, yeah. Things were working out. I don't know exactly why, but I think I was just coming out of that brain fog and feeling good again and also kind of wanting to feel like just sort of numb and just sort of charging harder in order to feel more like you had went through a dull period yeah like i want to feel you know and like want to like ramp this life back up and uh that started happening with thunk and and things were just dropping like easy for me up jumps like super easy like i would do like a switch back seven over some jump and be like eh, I'm gonna do it better <laughs> do it like <laughs> again better you know and uh it was it turned out pretty sweet I'm proud hey. of it all right Bertner I want to get into uh think thank area which is going to be this is going to be a big one but you know I got a highlight before we get into it I was noticing oh, okay Jesse Bertner has 20 video parts we got a lot of stuff to talk about but with every one of those 20 video parts you basically for the most part made a video to go along with that <laughs> so it's not just your part. It's the parts of up and coming riders, established riders, people that went on this journey with you. And so as we dove into doing this research, 
start realizing like how important you are to so many people in their careers and this tree, so to so to speak. A lot of people's parts are linear. Your part, your your um your career branches out like a freaking giant family tree of people from you know, Scott Stevens to John Cooley to Jessica Murr to Gus Engel to Jeno to Larson to Jaeger, Bogart, J Rob, Landvik, P Mac, Ted Borland, Beresford, like there Micah Hollinger, there's there's just the names go on forever. You know, Mitch Richmond and, and it's like you've had such a profound impact on so many people's lives through all these movies. And um I don't know. I just wanted to like highlight that because it's super important. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, I'm lucky, you know, and like, I will throw it back at you and say that they, you know, they helped me, you know, like, we did it together, and like, I said it before, and I'll say it again, like, they carried me, especially on the back half, <laughs> but like, man, yeah, really, like, they, you know, I think, I think I do have you know, an ability to pull people in. I think maybe because I just am overwhelmingly positive. I'm not really willing to see like defeat. Like I, I'm always going to, it's always a go. And I think that that's a pretty good attitude, even if it's a little bit fake ish seeming like it's not that great out here. It's like, just keep, let's just have fun and make it rad, you know? And, and, and I and I can always find the rad, so it's it's not fake with me. I'm just like, this is rad. Look, it's rad. And they're like, it is rad. And then people love that, and they pull into it, and I think the writers pull into that energy. Um, and so, yeah, that's I guess that's a skill. And um, But, yeah, they really, they really give from that. From that, once they're pulled in, then they're really giving to me, you know? And, like, yeah, like, I would say that you know we obviously we did it all together and really like some of these people have given so much to me and i'm super appreciative well your your family tree of borders runs deep and um i'm sure they all appreciate you as well um another thing about think tank that's really cool to think about too i wanted to see you elaborate on is you take a normal video Generally, it's about this like big cinematographer experience where it's like your your camera's got to be framed perfectly. It's got to be like here's our like it's kind of this big project for a lot of snow videos. But it seems like your guys' mentality is more just like just film the damn trick. Yeah, and like I I think I like I really can't take pressure. Like I've just been working hard all these years to like take pressure completely off of it. And Got like it. my relationship with snowboarding ha has gotten more and more where it just needs to be more and more pressure free. And that's always been what it's like. It's like, just strip away the pressure, like, and like, let the en energy is energy, like, let the energy shine, like, and just start moving, like, get out there and start moving. So like, don't be concerned, just start moving. It, what, what happens if you get people out and let's say it's a dance or something and like, like, does someone just come out and do the best dancing right off the bat? No, they just come out and they start kind of moving. Someone starts moving. And then someone else is like, nice, you're moving. I'll move. Boom, I'm going to move. I'm going to move. You're moving. We're moving. Now it's now you're ramping. Oh, you got that? Look at this. Bam, bam, bam. I'm dancing like this. You know, well, you're dancing like that. Oh, I'm going to dance like this. You know, like boom, boom, boom. Like, whoa, holy crap. Like, I didn't even know you could dance like that. You got to get to that, you know. So, like, just always having that, like, Petri dish, like, just ready to grow like just okay no like let's just like we're in a bubble it's just us you're in a safe space let's just create and like everything's a clip if you say everything's a clip hey guys everything's a clip how do you feel about your trip we're gonna feel pretty good we're about good. it. We had a trip of a lifetime. Yeah, it was stacking record shots. numbers. Like, hey, we yeah. just woke up and like Ross had the camera in our face, and I said something pretty funny. That's a clip. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, we're in the parking lot, and like, I did a like, uh, you know, a uh, hopscotch on the ice, and like, then like zinged out, and like Bearsford jumped on my board and did a hopscotch right afterwards. That's a clip. You know, like we're just filming. You know, we're filming energy. We're capturing energy, 
and portraying it, you know? So you just, you just get into a better place where you, you feel like, you know, you just feel like you're, you're winning. And so then you do win. <laughs> Unbelievable. The energy transfer is great. And I got to say, when we went to Massachusetts, I, I got to not think that trip. I've been, I've been a fly on the wall and been uh, surrounding a lot of this, yeah. this energy. We've had some, and I remember my first time coming from a <laughs> bit of a trick snob, spot snob. I'm like, the spots that are getting set up, I'm just like, this is the worst spot I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is insane. Yeah. And then the session's just going off. Like, it's yeah. going crazy. And I'm like, honestly, I I'm, can't even get in the mix. Like, you guys are good at this shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then cool st well, shit just starts happening yeah. and snowballing. Yeah, I mean, you... You never know what's going to come out of the pitch black on one of those nights. It could be a naked Grindies. Oh, my God. I forgot <laughs> about that. that happened? Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. My checkout, like, profile picture. I <laughs> yeah. did do a naked tail block, yeah. Yeah. You did a naked tail block. Yeah. The Southwick motocross track yeah. on a tire. What, yeah, dude. What, good memory. What inspired the... Uh, Close off. You were just couldn't say. Trying to couldn't clip say, up. But this isn't about me. This is about Jesse. You're so. like, this is a clip. I'm naked. <laughs> <laughs> You're using yeah, you know energy. what? I think it was the energy though. Yeah, the was, energy. Fucking it was the energy. Naked. Well, it was like Zoolander, like where like you know you had to literally take your clothes off to like beat Scott. You know, <laughs> 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 like I gotta rip my underwear. Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah love it. Something. <laughs> no, but like uh, I think you know I've been thinking about this a little bit more, but like part of that like taking the pressure off um and setting parameters around your snowboarding can like be a really freeing experience and like i love that just that i can look at like a spot and you know a lot of people can do this but like just looking at like almost nothing and knowing that i can create here i can show energy here like there's almost nothing here but there's a, just enough snow. There's just enough speed. There's a rock. There's a something or else. A piece of garbage. We're good. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's sweet. I'm still, like, very much, like, in love with that, you know? There's something you said to me years ago, and I've never been able to put my finger on it, and I don't know exactly how you worded it, but it was something along the lines of like, I was like basically saying, dude, you need to get outside your comfort zone. Like I was talking about getting outside my comfort zone snowboarding. And you're like, no, dude, you need to stay in it. And like, I don't know if it like the way it milk the edge of your comfort zone or something. I don't know. Remember your verbiage. Do you want to elaborate on that? That sounds pretty sweet. That guy must have been <laughs> smart. It was no, it was, it, it was very insightful. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember that, but I mean, yeah, I mean, like Andrew Reynolds would say to stay in your comfort zone, do some frontside flips. Maybe partially some of that, you know, like, like really, I mean, there is that aspect of that idea. But for me as a snowboarder, progression for me happens very um, small like that, like little steps forward, like still to this day, like, and so I, I could see that, like, operating from your comfort zone as far as, like, the movements you're really used to doing and then just building, 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 little, little, little. Like, you, like, are you worried about doing the big thing? Like, just come up to it slowly. You know, like, that's how I started. Like, I would go down in this place called the meadow in front of my house, and there was a, at the bottom of the meadow there's a dip, and it's a jump. And I would start, like, literally, like, to where I couldn't even make it up the jump. I would just go bloop and then I'd hike a little higher and then I'd go over it and then I'd hike a little higher, a little higher. And by the end I'm blasting, you know, but like it was all about that. Like what Breezy said when he was on here, that was so cool to hear that that's like the same mentality. I mean, obviously we're completely opposites, <laughs> but like, but, but, I, steps. but like, dude, like yeah. exactly. I really appreciated him saying that. Like, yeah, dude, I'm going to like take away a little bit at a time until I'm like doing this monster, like death defying thing. But like, approached it from a very like analytical way in that you know it was cool what about the statement limitations cannot be strength yeah so that's sort of um in a communication from a aspect of communication like having a message if you if you narrow your message it can it can come across more clearly in that way and also like taking something that um 
like it pushes you if you have some sort of uh something lacking in your game you know you can you know you you can go harder in another direction and in that way you can become something special where other people aren't you know so instead of just like checking all boxes like or being worried about like man i can't do that you know and that's okay you know like go ahead and be like a be known for something you know and like follow your sort of where it's naturally going for you and obviously you want to try to be as full spectrum as you can be but like it's okay to be to be heavy in one direction and like and really dig into it you'll find yourself in in territory that others aren't and and as far as um communication and art i think that's cool to be where others necessarily aren't or less people are and and you're introducing something to people by by being out in that zone so that's uh like my limitations have very much like driven my uh my snowboarding and it's been um interesting because i have the mental blocks and i've just navigated around them and like my my desire to be good and to be you know to to keep chasing it and to do new do new things has pushed me into this these weird places and has everything to do with my limitations well said great well great said. perspective shift uh on on that stuff i love it um and with that being said i think we should get into a guest question from none other than sean genovese oh yeah here we go yo jesse <laughs> sean here i always loved all the creativity while working on the think tank movies and that always began in preseason, coming up with a theme for each video. I was hoping you could share with the audience part of your creative process while uh, coming up with a theme. And if there was any one particular that you liked more or the most, or you had the fun, most fun doing, or, or some insight on maybe one that was near and dear to your heart. Look forward to hearing your answer. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. Love that guy. Uh, I mean, yeah, we were, we, Geno, Pika, me, uh, we were always batting stuff around, but I think in the end, like I would bring one forward that was kind of like, this is what we should do. And usually they were like, yes, but sometimes they were like, no, <laughs> but uh, a lot of them, you know, came about, from walking, like going for walks, walking and listening to music is a powerful thing. Um, and I live in Ballard and would walk every day down into town from my house, listening to music and you just daydream, you know, daydreaming is super awesome. Like I, I've always tried to find a place to daydream in my life. And that's like tramp skating was a daydream tool really like <laughs> i just go on the trampoline and just do tricks and like i'm not even thinking about the tricks my feet are just doing i'm pedaling <laughs> just on the bike the board's flipping but <laughs> i'm like pedaling. dreaming about stuff you know like and being in motion really sets your brain moving like so walking listening to music a lot of those concepts started coming about and and pika and i walking around green lake specifically would like come up with some stuff and just start like hatching movies and talking and basically creating an entire movie and it's a three mile walk. And like, maybe even like when we get to the end of the walk, we're like, that movie sucks. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but we like, scratch the idea. Like, okay, it's called like, we did this one called Margaret. And we're like, okay, it's called Margaret. <laughs> and we're like, mate, we're like, oh my God, this is genius. You know, we got this movie called Margaret. It's so weird. And we like get through the whole thing and like talking about what the titling will look like, you know, and like, and then we get done, we're walking like, yeah, it's not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's the last time you talk about Margaret. Yeah. Until now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. But, um, yeah, Jeno would always come with ones too. And we were just like, but really like, I think like, um, the, I could take like something so weird and those guys would be able to like make it look beautiful, which was amazing. Uh, I think one for me that was really cool. They're all really fun, but I like I really liked Ransack Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Um I thought it was very artistically cohesive and um that we shot 
we shot everything at the very beginning of the year in the first snow. So we shot all the name tiles. So like, it was like, if you're even considering going to be in this movie, like we're making you a flag with your name on it. And we're going to like come to this junkyard and like film in this. And we're going to like, you know, it's up to you now to get a video part, but like we're ready, you know? So that whole thing, like I just liked ones that were encapsulated really cleanly in like a look and a vibe. And, uh, that was, that was one I liked a lot. Most movies, they do that after, too. That's pretty cool that you actually conceptualize everything from the beginning, get people involved so they feel like they're part of it. Yeah. Make we them had feel some, like they have a home for the season, you know? We had some epic meetings like that at our house. I think Jeno might be referencing that, too, where we would, like, get everyone that was going to be in the video together in Seattle. And we'd sit in the room together, and I'd, and I'd write this, like, full, like, I'd write, like, a book report <laughs> on, like, on the, the movie, you know? <laughs> And it was, like, basically, like, marching orders of, like, kind of like a hype up, though. Like, a, like just a lot of, like, exclamation points in there. And, like, a lot of, like, let's get in our own bubble. Like, you know, which was big for me. It was, like, let's watch every single snowboard movie and talk about it and celebrate every other project, and every other rider. And now let's not watch any snowboard movies and not talk about any other snowboard videos, any other riders, what they're doing. We don't care. We're think tank. We're in a bubble now. Hmm. We do this in our, we do whatever we want in our bubble. We'll check in with these guys in nine months. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, so those meetings were really fun. When I think about that now, like having that many people at my house in Seattle and Pika and I like hosting so many people, it's just like, wow, I'm so glad we did that. Because I like will never get all those people together again. It really rallied the troops. I remember, you know, my friends, you know, particularly Scott and and Chris Beresford would come back and they'd be fired up. Yeah, it got the people going. So if you just run through some, let's just run through the the list of video parts because I wrote them down. So you know, before pre think think we have ninety seven polar bears, or ni sorry ninety seven ninety seven and uh, polar bears dog sleds igloos. Uh, 98, we have Northern Exposure. 99, we have 100%. Then Survival of the Titus, 49th Chamber, In for Life, Season for No Reason. Then we get into Think Think. First one is Thunk. Love that video. I think it's my favorite <laughs> one. Uh, Cue the Birds. Great concept. You have birds and everything else and crazy handwriting. Patchwork, all the crazy uh, stuff on the screen, the little titles and everything. Thanks, Brain. The intro with Scott throwing all the sponsors was so good. I mean, Stack Footy, we'll come back to that and get into that because that one's incredible. Cool story. Right Brain, Left Brain, Ransack Rebellion, uh, Mind the Video Man, Brain Dead Heart Attack, Right Turn, Left Turn, Methods of Prediction, Weather Outside is Weather, and then, you know, we got Susie Greenberg, and there's some st stuff in, in between there. I don't know if I forgot anything. No, I think that's... Yeah, there were some, like, movies that I had stuff in and little parts here and there, too, but, like... It was really, yeah. So each one of those, like stack footy, the concept, like incredibly well executed. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that, yeah, actually that one could be my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're all my favorite, but yeah, stack footy was so amazing just how it came to birth, it came to life because like Granger, the Yankee peddler was wearing the stack money shirt at High Cascade, it's, like this huge like ghetto gown, you know, and he's like, and Micah Hollinger was working as the skate the skate park monitor then and and uh he was like uh oh, stack footy let's stack money let's stack footy you know and like just like oh my god this concept this thing writes itself you know and like we had a t-shirt done mid-summer <laughs> we already had the think that stack footy shirt sold out of them at camp and then started making the movie so that thing was just like <laughs> <laughs> that's so sick yeah that thing was what just, a great name too yeah yeah you got something, bud? I do. Let's get into a uh, Patreon question from your good buddy, Sean Lucy. You subscribe to a particularly finicky style of snowboarding. One might compare to a manual skater. What's the longest you ever battled for a trick? Also, how much rain does it take to put the camera away? <laughs> oh, dude, Lucy. <laughs> Lucy an air horn. Yeah, yeah, huge air horn. Lucy, like, carried a big part of Think Tank for years. Uh, made a bunch of the... Made the Think Tank Almanac movies, Methods of Prediction, uh, Weather Outside is Weather. 
a uh, super epic dude. Um, yeah, uh, the longest I've ever battled a trick was for Greenberg. Um, it was uh, the, the hopscotch kickflip. That was five five days over the course of of two year two or three years. Wow. And some of those days were, you know, 200, 300. Maybe. Tries? Yeah. Some of them weren't, but it was just, uh, it was funny because it was the first trick I set out. You know, when you make a trick list, which is sort of like a doomed, a doomed thing, like maybe just don't make trick lists. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know you get bored in the fall and you're like, I'm going to do all these tricks, but like, it, I don't know if it works for you. Oh, it worked great. I test, I put a, I think it works great, but I'm, I'm pro trick list, but keep going. <laughs> okay. So it works for grand days, but for me, it's more, <laughs> I'm like a pre. like I already said pressure, you know? So like yeah. just writing it down is maybe too much pressure for me, <laughs> <laughs> but like I, uh, I, you know, it's the first thing I set out for Greenberg. Like this is going down like right away. I got to just do this. No one's done it. And, um, I think Beresford had obviously thought of it before. Um, he's a hopscotch God. But there's not very many of us chasing these moves. So it's like, I can actually, i not sure I talked to Beresford, but I definitely talked to Max. I was like, hey, I'm going to do this trick for this movie. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so this sick. one's off limits. <laughs> like, Just there's, putting it off limits before the season. <laughs> yeah, like there's not that many of us that would even get around to it, mm -hmm. you know? There's only a few of us. So, and then we were all filming for the same movies. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, that one, like, yeah, that one five days over years who's the, yeah who's the poor soul that had to saddle up and yeah, film that one lucy probably huh? no it was um gary schmohawk ah. yeah yeah no he uh, Square milton he, no, no schmohawk yeah Shmohawk. yeah he uh yeah gary filmed like i think every one of those yeah because he was in norway too because two of those days were in norway and i actually ended up getting my ender because i couldn't get that trick so i went like two basically like one and a half days on it and it was like i gotta try something else <laughs> but anyways uh it ended up going down amazing we also have a guest question well, he from also asked how much rain does it take to put the oh, camera yeah. away well that one he's got to answer that one <laughs> no <laughs> amount of rain Lucy. <laughs> are you kidding me dude <laughs> no i'm brutal with that dude like i'm such a I'm so sorry, filmers. <laughs> I, I love You're you like, guys. It's fine dude. out and it's pouring. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do a huge shout out for Lucy for the hard flip filming. Like, uh, I like, you know, I, I, uh, he lead cam me doing that trick. Like this guy puts lead in cam. work. Yeah. Like he was lead, big lead cam heavy. guy for his years and big thing. So that's an unstrapped trick. I'm not strapping in. He has to strap in. And I'm trying to stay in the moment, so he's like running up as quick as possible. And we're this is this, I didn't get that thing in less than a hundred tries. No way. Wow. <laughs> you know, like what a battle dog, battle yeah. dog, dude. There's something to be said too. It's like somebody that's got the positive mindset with you while you're battling, because it's so easy. You know, we've all had those experiences when you're filming with somebody, and you can tell the guy behind the lens just does not. He's not do hyped. That. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like it's tough to stay to stay with us on some of these missions. That's why a lot of, we end up filming each other a lot too, but like, yeah, Lucy is, Lucy is very um, good like that. Yeah. And Garrett Reed too. And Gary Milton, actually. <laughs> I mean, Gary Milton's so positive. <laughs> like he mm -hmm. would, you're, you got this, you know, <laughs> you know never, never That's give really up. Good, like <laughs> the thing you have to do with Gary Milton is just get him to not yell in the shot. You know, <laughs> He'll get that thing set up in 30 seconds. Yeah. So you're going to shovel harder than everybody. Jeez. Yeah. I, I've been with battles with Scott where I'm just like, please, generator, run out of gas. Like, <laughs> oh, please, yeah. camera, battery, die. <laughs> yeah. I hope the police kick us out. And you're like, but Scott, already, you got this. Next try, buddy. He's Come already on. landed it, though, is the problem with Scott. <laughs> yeah, like 20 times. Yeah, just did yeah like I, got it, I got it a little better. Uh, you know what? I, 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 I like the hand drag. I, I got you right here. <laughs> I got you right here. <laughs> Dude, just some type of, like, there's all the old think think outros where it's like, Words where you're not entirely sure what he's even saying. Like, what, <laughs> yeah. what do I what, what do I add to do, Dodds? Really? Yeah, what do I add to do, Dodds? <laughs> he's like trying to say, what do I got to do, Dodds? He's yeah. like, Aaron Dodds, the photographer. Yeah. What do I add to do, Dodds? <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, he doesn't even have time to talk. 
<laughs> you know, like the, it's just his like his mind's moving so he's fast. Already, yeah. yeah, he's already moving. He's already dropping in again. Well, we got a guest question from none other than Scott Stevens. Here we go. Guys, uh, Scott here. Jesse, heard you're on the show. That's uh, amazing. Uh, my question is um, about the bungee snapping uh, incident <laughs> in Ransack Rebellion, um, the beginning of your part. Just backstory, bruises, um, you know, disclaimers. Uh, can't wait to listen to the episode. Thanks, guys. Uh, that's an awesome question because it's a pretty funny story. So <laughs> you guys, uh, the bungee came out in like, I don't remember what year. But we were at the trade where. show and like Banshee Bungie's there and like the dude's cool and he, he hooks Jeno up with one. And uh we are immediately going on a trip to Japan and Jeno brings it to Japan. He's like, I got this bungee cord. We're like, What the hell is this thing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and like we didn't know how it worked. And then Jeno's like, Oh, we need like a rope to tie it to something, you know, and then you use it. And we're like, We don't have a rope, but you in Japan every time you get on a gondola you put like a little condom over your board and there's like these little <laughs> yeah, no crappy kidding. ropes around them that like cinch it down they're like the worst ropes <laughs> <laughs> and Jenna just grabbed one of those and it's like this is the rope and they're like cool that'll work you know and we used it and it was hilarious <laughs> the first time we bungeed, we just like bungeed for fun, like on a flat, <laughs> like, just to test it out. <laughs> like Yo should Pika, and like we we're all getting in. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like and we didn't even use it to hit anything. I think on the trip, <laughs> we just like did it for fun. <laughs> and then uh, fast forward like a decade, <laughs> and we're still using that damn rope, dude. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Like years later, not a decade, but five years later. And we're in Alaska, and we're doing this, like, mighty, 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 mighty Boston's bungee pole, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, like, all hands on deck, and I'm, like, and you don't want to be the last guy. No. <laughs> like, just FYI. Like, and I was, I realized it, like, I'm the last guy. Oh, no. You know? And, like. And anyways, the thing snapped. Uh, the little crappy rope finally gave out, and it and it like hit me like a shotgun, dude. And I like literally like fly in the air. No, it's like what bad? I'm just like, go, and I'm just like up in the air, and yeah, I just had this gnarly bruise on my like love handle and like <laughs> along my back and stuff. But the 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 cool thing about the story is that like Ross Phillips is filming, and like who films a bungee pull? Like nobody. But Ross is like the kind of guy that learns how to use a camera. And he had it on this thing called loop record because we're so into like getting lifestyles. And for a guy that doesn't talk a lot, he's like the lifestyle master. And I think that's part of why he was so good at it was because he just never said anything. So he would just have the camera on you and you'd just be like, at a certain point you just forget he's there. And um, anyways, he, he was doing loop record, which is something you use for shooting wildlife where like if a shark jumps out of the water, you're not going to record dead water for hours. So once the shark jumps, you hit the button and it's actually been recording and dumping four seconds at a time. This whole time it records dumps, records dumps. And so if you hit the button then it saves that last four seconds. So he was like doing that on our bungee pole <laughs> and he like hit the button and we got the shot. Wow. Which is super funny. And it's in Ransack. Yeah, it's in Ransack. <laughs> to throw it on the screen. Shout out. Let's give Ross Phillips a nice air horn for that. Yeah. The sound you make. Is, oh, dude, that <laughs> yeah. must have hurt, man. It was. <laughs> I felt like the world. I felt like, like everything was out to kill me on that trip. It was <laughs> insane, dude. I had already had like this insane slam. I was. Yeah. This is like a, I love like a bunch of, of war dogs sitting around talking about <laughs> yeah. war stories. Ah, in Ransack here, I took the bungee to the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, when you're that first person, and I've I've seen a couple of people get hit. It's there's a lot of force behind that. A lot thing. of force. So earlier, this is fascinating to me. You were talking about how you went on walks to find inspiration for the movie, and I I just am fascinated by the idea of finding and searching out creativity and the hunt and how people like yourself do it, especially in a world where we live in the creativity destroyers, aka the phones in our pockets. <laughs> yeah yeah are they creativity destroyers they're distractions they're distractions where you get sucked out of your creative self i think 
For I think, some, it's like a think tank of ideas that they yeah. use. But are you in like a flow state or are you in like a dead state? Yeah, I'm not act, <laughs> acting on them when I'm watching it. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. think in that way you're probably right. Yeah. No, I think like, um, yeah, I think flow state like is what I'm talking about. Like, how do you get into it? You know, and like, um, for me, yeah, like taking walks, bouncing on the trampoline, these things where I can where I can um, daydream were really like the access point to creative energy and you just start telling a story, you know, and it's like, you know, maybe you're probably in your story. It's a story about yourself, <laughs> but you like to start extrapolating and you just feel the energy like building and you're like, Whoa, I'm surfing something now inside my myself that like feels like, Whoa, think of the energy. If like this went like this and maybe a song's playing too. And that's just like, Whoa. So you're putting out, images in your head of uh, maybe snowboarding or whatever and, and there's music to it that's making a snowboard movie in your head and you can really feel that and you're like i want to recapture this in reality now you know and so yeah and i would go and walk with you know a book too so to write in mm -hmm. so i pretty much got like a journal for every single like a full book full of ideas for every single movie every year that i was making movies and and I still do it now, but it's more for like writing music or poetry or something. But All right, like, sell sell me on the journaling. On journaling? Yeah, just having a journal. Well, you gotta like capture some of that energy. You gotta write some of that down, and if it's surging, you know, you can just kind of blah get it out there, and then you can go back and like, and you don't know how you did it. You're like, how did I do that? That's amazing. I did that. You know, like. It's not always there for you. So the muse, you know, like everyone talks about it. It's very real. So like if you're with anything, I think, you know, if you any anything you're trying to do, if you want to have a brainstorm, like get yourself into a position physically where you're in like a flow state and it, your mind is loosened up and now and then wait for those just just exist in it. And then when those moments come, like capture a little bit of it, write it down a little bit. Or, or speak it into a phone or whatever you do, you know? And, like, man, if you lose those things, those little nuggets, oh, jeez, I know what you dude. mean. You're never going to get them back. <laughs> you, know, you know what's interesting, though, that I got to think, I had journals so, when I was younger, I used to always have a journal, like, especially, and I, I almost, like, when I had a flip phone, it was like I'd write down all my tricks, all my, every, just journal all the time, all these ideas, and I do feel like as these social media apps have invaded our, our space, it gets harder and harder because we're never bored. I feel like a lot of those things are products of boredom. Got to right? be bored. So, so you you have to be bored. So like I know it's a lot of my ideas when I'm if I'm on a plane and I don't turn the TV on and I'm reading a book and then I'll put the book down and they'll flow out of me, right? But yeah. if I sit on there and I go on a plane and I turn the movie on, I ain't writing shit down because I'm watching the movie because you're not bored, you're distracted. Yeah. And so in and with the phone or when you, you got the TV on at home or you got your your phone in your pocket, ain't shit coming out of your, you ain't, nothing creative is coming out of your body when you do that. So I like, like, like just kind of putting the light, the light bulbs going off is like boredom is just such a great inhibitor for creativity and yeah. putting yourself in positions where you get bored is how you come up with oh. cool story, right turn, left turn, ransack rebellion. Totally. You gotta, like, yeah, you gotta make room for boredom in your life. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I look at that at all for Ollie a lot. Like we're like, you know, it's like Pika and I will talk about it. Like, let's, we got to let him get bored. Like, don't worry about him. Just like, he'll be like, I want to watch a show or like, I want to play video games. You know, it's just like, no, no, no. You know, just say no, like three more times and he'll just truly have to be up to his own devices. And then something is going to happen inside his brain. That's going to be really positive, you know? So yeah, I had a lot of boredom growing up so <laughs> you know and i was able to tap into it like i was walking you know i worked on the fishing boat and i would want to daydream there you really want to escape you know sometimes when you're on the fishing boat so it's just 32 feet and um i would walk on the running boards just on the outside there's like a foot there that you can walk along and then go to the bow and then you know and come around to the other running board and then plop into the stern, walk around in the stern, pop back out and just do that and just think and just 
daydream, you know, and like I didn't really have much to daydream about <laughs> until I found snowboarding. And then all of a sudden my daydreams were like fueled and it was about snowboarding that I was daydreaming. And, you know, and then when videos and magazines, then I was daydreaming about snowboard videos and magazines. So that's pretty much, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of, a lot of good shit came from yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So nice work on that. Okay, this guest question is brought to you by our good friends over at Union Bindings. Now, everybody knows Union Bindings are the best. It's obvious. If you're going to write any other binding, you basically got to be paid by that company. If you're a consumer, you should be buying unions. They're better than all the other bindings. Everybody knows that. So, uh, you know, I ride the Union Forces. I run their split board binding when I'm split boarding. Sometimes I just wear them around the house. I take them off. I put them on my shoes. I wear them like they're, uh, they wear them like they're slides, you know, like, like sandals. So, uh, if you're thinking about getting some bindings, pick up the union forces. That's my personal favorite. It's like a medium flex, great all around binding. That being said, let's get into this guest question. Here we go. Uh, we happen to have a guest question from none other than photographer and Leunda, Mike Yoshida, also McGruber quote extraordinaire. Here we go. What up bomb hole? Yoshir. Um, stoked you got Jesse Bertner in the booth today. Uh, I got a quick question for Jesse. Um, Jesse, you fostered many people's careers uh, over your time in the snowboard industry. And my question for you is, was there any particular rider that exceeded, far exceeded what you thought they were capable of achieving um, and also, was there a most improved rider um, that just kept on getting better with time? Um, stoked mm. to listen to your bomb hole and stoked to hear this answer. Peace. Uh, what up, yo? <laughs> 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 um, that's a tough one. Because, like, yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. There's just so many awesome riders uh, i guess like the take scott out of the equation because i knew he was like the best right off the bat <laughs> um everyone else blossomed brewster chris brewster <laughs> dude that might be chris brewster <laughs> like that whole crew surprised the hell out of me hop those guys were just like i'm like where did you guys come from you know and then brewster kept getting better like Hup, too. Like, I mean, yeah. Larson was, like, the best from the beginning. Um, uh, yeah, maybe those two. And, and, you know, McCarthy, too. Like, <laughs> McCarthy <laughs> had no business, dude. Like, <laughs> he was on a Nidecker just, like, cheesing around. Like he was on a Nidecker? <laughs> he was on a Nidecker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just like, who is this guy? Love you, Pat. Great energy. And then he just Great like energy. ramped it up, dude. Pure force. Mm -hmm. Hossed it in. He did hoss it. <laughs> just kept hossing until you're like, oh, you're the guy. Like <laughs> you were just kind of trying and now you're the guy. That's how it happens. You know, you just try, try, try. You're like, this guy tries really hard. And then boom, you're the guy. J-Rob. Like <sighs> crazy. Like his like trajectory. Like just um was kind of just this kid and then truck kicked the door down you know like jason robinson yeah he starts off he's filming banger parts for think tank fast forward a few years he's back rodeo sevening into birthday bowl in alaska Facts, like, oh yeah. my god dude yeah his trajectory yeah i call j-rob the truth that's my nickname for him it's a good nickname we got to get him on the show um amazing well, I think it might be that time, but Oh, snap. Do you know what time it is? Name that video part. Name that video part. Okay, Name That Video Part is presented by the Icon Pass. Our season of fun is fast approaching with access to 50 destinations worldwide. From the East Coast to the West, across Canada... The European Alps to Japan and beyond, the language barrier has just been broken. This season, get ready to explore Chamonix in France, Sun Valley in Idaho, Snow Basin in Utah. Additionally, new pass options have been added to the mix. 
starting at only $269 adult. The Icon Pass Session 2-day and Icon Pass Session 3-day offer a range of affordable entry points. It's time to bring the stoke in and get ready to let the joy out. With an Icon Pass in hand across 50 of the best mountains in the world, head on over to IconPass.com. Get yours today. All right, Jesse. How are we feeling? Confidence level, 0 through 10. Um, 10. Oh, bitch. <laughs> wow. wow. Just kidding. <laughs> that was heavy, dude. Just dropped a 10. <laughs> All right, were you ready? <laughs> yeah, dude. This is going to be hilarious. We read. Hit me. Oh, well, yeah, I got this all day, dude. Thanks for the lob, dude. Thanks for the lob. McCarthy. Woo! Thunk. That's such, it's Ender. Can we just Ender. run it back and just appreciate it once, too? Dude, just, just think of time. him in the Seahawks jersey. Ah! Front cork shifty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The front cork shifty got us. <laughs> yeah, dude. The front cork shifty. I mean, he brought that. Maybe, maybe uh, he might have brought that to snowboarding. Maybe. I mean, him and Marco and JP were kind of, but I don't know what year was who was first. Um, the yeah. Seahawks Regardless. jersey was dope, too. Yeah. Yeah, we need more people in the backcountry and sporting, sporting yeah. jerseys. Powder yeah. and jerseys. That's just yeah, a powder thing. and cotton and yeah. maybe a little bit of lycra. I don't know what's in there. All of it. Yeah. 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 Great thing. polyester, dude! I did it. Uh, you did. Yeah, he oh yeah, you he won. won. Prize. Sorry. Oh, hey, Ken, I forgot. Was there a, was there a harder one? Uh, no, no, that's it. <laughs> I mean, you can <laughs> guess the next one. You too, can guess you the next one, one, and we'll listen. bleep it out. It's okay. It. Whatever we you got, say. They're uh, so hard for the people, the audience members, but they get to kind of research it. Yeah, you get to research it. You, this is what you want. You want a bomb oh hole prize God, pack, dude. This is so. It's a sick. Yeti carry all. Thanks to the folks over at Yeti. In there, you got all kinds of goods that's available. Where buds? Bombhole.com. What? These are we got so bombhole sick. hats. We threw some sweatpants. We got a beanie. We, we this got guy up. bucket wow, hat. Wow, 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 we wow, also wow, have wow. some slow tide towels. Yep, he got hooked up. Slow tide has been a sponsor of the show. Um, their founder comes from snowboarding. They do all kinds of cool stuff, all kinds of cool collaborations with their towels and blankets. They got Grateful Dead collaboration. I think I have a Beatles collab they at got the crib. Beatles. Yeah. And then they got the surf ponchos. That's my favorite. If you're looking for a surf poncho, you want to go get absolutely shacked and change in a parking lot where you can go dong out and not everybody has to see it. Head on over to slowtide.co. Use promo code BOMBHOLE20, BOMBHOLE20, and you'll save 20% on your next order. It's a great gift. If you're looking for a great gift, head on over to Slow Tide. 20% is a fat discount. 20 percentile. Now, um... That being said, we also have bomb hole towels as well. So, this is part two of name that video part. If you know the answer, comment on the photo of Jesse on Instagram. That's where we pick our winner. And here we go. Oh. I actually do know this. I do know it, but I'm not going to. We'll black it out. Bleep it out. I mean, I I would have to think know. about that it. That means you don't know. I recognize it for sure. He recognizes it. Yeah. That was like snowboard rock. Of course, you recognized it. No, but I think I could pull it out. But. Okay, thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. Sorry, Scott. I didn't get that one right off the bat. He's got that one probably right now already. Yeah, he's like, uh, yeah, you guys are that's stupid. I actually have that on a playlist. It's called <laughs> Deluxe Edition. He drives around listening well, to no, music from. I, I actually do know that. Of course, I know that one. <laughs> Did I it just hit you? Yeah. Yeah. I edited that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A legendary Once part. you edit a movie and you've heard the song that many times, you, it sits with you. Yeah, well, definitely. But yeah, when you've edited a lot. Oh, true. You've edited a lot. But yeah, I know that one. Well, we're talking about video parts. We came off the name of that video part. Did you play the exit music? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, Blacked it out. <laughs> where do you find music? Oh, um, on my walks. <laughs> I would walk down to um, Sonic Boom and Ballard and just... This is like kind of interesting because I would, I would do this for a long time. I would just go into the actual record store and just listen to stuff that they had to listen to. 
And I, I, that's where I found like a lot of the music for Think Tank and like a couple of reasons behind that, because, you know, you could just, there's people that are really good at diving into just the internet to find music, but, and Jenna was better at that than me. And Lucy's really good at that. But for me, I liked it when some people kind of curated it <laughs> and they had already done a lot of the work. So to get up on the shelf, um, there was some curation there and they're probably pretty darn good. We're talking like staff picks at Sonic Boom. That's what you're. Yeah. That's staff cool. picks are just like listening stations. Yeah. Like they have like a few listening stations in there. And, and then I would look, first thing I would do is I would look at the record label and, and see if these are some people we could maybe mess with. Like, Oh yeah, we could probably work with these guys. Like they're not huge. It's not, you know, scary. Explain why that. Well, just because usually we wouldn't have enough money to license a song from a big record label, depending on how cool they were. You know, sometimes it really worked out. Um, you and paid for music rights for all movies? Yep. Yeah, and that... Commendable. <laughs> yeah, we did. And, um, you know, we got Modest Mouse <laughs> for like 200 bucks one time or Damn. something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes it works out, but... Um, uh, sometimes it doesn't and uh, we've yeah we've been we've had good and bad experiences with that it's pretty stressful and and christina worked a lot on that and it was always stressful for her as well and but we try to find bands that were down or you would just go to the concert too go to the concert listen to it wow they're awesome go up talk to them Hey, we're making a snowboard movie. Would you guys be down? Yeah, talk to this person. He'd give you, you the know, manager's and, number. Yeah, and then when you go to them, you're like, hey, we talked to the band and they were down. So then at least you got that. That going carries for you, some you know? weight. Yeah, one really cool one for Tim Eddy's song in, um, I think it was Cool Story. Uh, I bought this CD at Sonic Boom and I just listened to it over and over and over for a while just kind of listening to it in the background of the car and then one day i just like turned it up and was like whoa this song's amazing and I, i've listened to this probably like 10 times all the way through and now this song is amazing like 10 times later and i was just like god okay i looked at the cd i'm like all right and i looked them up on the internet and they're like from norway but they're playing in store at sonic boom in ballard today <laughs> you know i was like really? what <laughs> walked out like we went down listened to them talked to them like put it together it's really cool that's incredible yeah it's like meant to be right there serendipitous yeah totally and pika is so good at talking to people too so she's like not afraid at all to just go up to him like, hi i loved it so much you know <laughs> like I just like br like break down all barriers you know she's like a barrier destroyer that's, cr that's like i'm trying sick. to be like cool off to the side you know <laughs> but like she's just mysterious and cool in. on the side yeah <laughs> yeah the little easter egg hunt for the mysterious song that works the quest for the song is a is a beautiful thing yeah totally. and seattle's a good place for it because it's kind of a music a little hot spot huh yeah definitely you can find stuff that is really good that where they just want to be heard. And then that usually fits in with our budget because we never like messed with, you know, big budgets for music. Yeah. I heard tech nine spent a lot. A lot of money. Their, their, their budget. Dude, we've, we've had Michael Jackson on, <laughs> on a track and they say you can not, and no one can get Michael Jackson. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. Incredible. Yep. <laughs> All right. On the subject of video stuff, we have another guest question from, Ted Borland. Here we go. What up, Burner? <laughs> kind of a little question for you. Maybe it's just a topic, conversation, but either way, something that I think during Mind the Video Man, you kind of had a little light bulb moment about this, passed it on to the crew, and it's something that stuck with me for years. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on the term premiere cheer and how does that term affect the process of filming a video part? Excited to hear your answer. Excited to listen to the show. Talk to you guys soon. Ted, legend. Did you guys see that clip he put out the other day on IG of like some of his heaters over the years? Oh, so many A grades. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Such an insane snowboarder. Uh, just, it's fun to get reminded of it. Um, 
but yeah, Ted's awesome. Uh, yeah, so premiere cheers. Yeah, that's I'll I'll approach that one from the um from the uh, what do you say on here clip high clip high yes from the clip high standpoint like dude you want to get a little bit of a juice a juicer of the uh, serotonin the premiere and then the premiere cheer uh, really like can hit you and like <laughs> I think maybe around there we like started talking about like filming for premiere cheers you know like. <laughs> What's gonna? What are they gonna freak out for at the premiere? Let's just make it all about that, you know. Like, where's your premiere chair, you know? So that's probably what uh, he's talking about. Mind the video man. Um, yeah, I think like that shot of Jaeger when he's doing the handstand and he walks up <laughs> to me and I just stick the lens and he goes, "Scott Stevens, all out your boy," and like knuckles the lens and then, like. <laughs> keeps walking on his hands and then reverse tucks it in you know like that that same day uh lando um miller flipped my fish eye oh that clip's so good <laughs> yeah like those are that's kind of like what we're talking we're looking for those magical moments that are going to be like big premiere cheers you know love that yeah. i've talked about this with you too but there's also the mentality of filming a clip mainly so your friends you're like i know my buddy's gonna like this one Oh yeah. Yeah. And like, I, you know, that's the only reason I'm snowboarding. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> <laughs> like these days, like, uh, you know, like I love snowboarding, but really I love filming, <laughs> like getting clips and really I love doing it for my friends reactions and really, really, really. I want Scott Stevens to like it. <laughs> I'm really just filming for Scott. <laughs> like, I'm like only snowboarding for him. And he's, he just keeps like wanting more. So I'm like, all right, dude, I'll give you more. I'll like, give you more. Yeah. The guy wants more. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. He's great in that way as a friend too. He's like, man, saw that shove it. You did. I'm really loving this. Show. You're like, dude, I've done <laughs> I know. seven thousand shove it like, yeah. in my life. Thank you, though. It makes I feel great. Yeah, I literally did like the worst heel flip I've ever done in my life the other day. Really and he was like, dude, loving the heel flip, loving the energy. <laughs> he knows just what to say. Yeah, loving those heel flips, loving those yeah. heel flips. <laughs> Oh, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Um, he brought, you know, he brought the term to light. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, he's been a victim of camber shaming. Uh, <laughs> I like this. I'm not familiar with it. Well, other than that, it's my life. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's really popular to ride like a cambered board. Like, really, it's like if you're like legit, you're at a camber board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I noticed, like, I was just curious, have you, have you been a victim of camber shaming? No, I don't think anyone's really like <laughs> bold enough to camber shame me. What kind, but, of, uh, what kind of camber are you rolling? It's pretty much flat. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's um, yeah, it's basically flat. But no, I, I haven't really experienced too much camber shaming. But it's definitely, uh, <laughs> it's definitely you know, it's definitely swinging in that direction for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I could see, I could see us being kind of marginalized. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, it's it's cool. Um, I, I just point to Reese if anyone wants to like camber shame. Yeah, it's like, well, my boy Reese is like out on a one fifty four box scratcher, like doing a ten eighty over an eighty foot jump. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we're good, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, let's talk lib tech. Let's talk uh, pro model. Yeah. So, um, well, I've been lucky to have a pro model with lib tech. It's kind of like sort of a fluke you know like i don't think it should have really happened you know like i got a board with my name on it when i turned 30 so that's pretty deep you know considering as like when i was younger i was like would see someone get a check out and they'd be 24 years old and i'd be like whoa <laughs> grandpa you know like <laughs> this guy's not going anywhere <laughs> you know like <laughs> you know here i am i'm 30 i get my pro model board you know but um that it really, um, you know, it has every everything to do with Pete. Sorry, the co-founder of LibTech, and just his vision for me as a snowboarder, and his, you know, his never wanting to give up on the people around him, and especially me and my snowboarding. He like really 
he was like, yeah, you, you could carry a board, you know, and it really shouldn't have worked, but it did. And, and, um, and I got to have that Burtner box scratcher for, I guess we did 12 years. This is the last one right here. And Christina did every single graphic for it. And so it's just been this awesome run we had of this board and, and, uh, it's super jibby, you know, fun board. And it kind of like was a perfect time for me to swing my riding into even more mini shred and stuff. And I was looking for reasons to limit again, like the parameters around me to, to, to express more freely. And that was like a great one was to having a shorter, softer, fun board that really like said like, okay, you're not doing this stuff anymore. I'm not just like pointing it at jumps anymore. That's, that was the past like era of me. And I'm just it's like, I don't have that like adrenaline like that anymore. I still want to explore snowboarding, but I'm not just doing it through like an adrenaline place. You know, I want to do it strictly through uh, creative energy and, and that the board really helped me do that. It was just really cool to have like a board specifically made for that, you know, like, and that, and, and it was like, okay, well now I have this board that does that. So that's what I'm really going to do. And you can really see my, my video parts start really transitioning to that, like with the board, you know, I wanted to ride my board. And so like, yeah, it's been amazing. It's a cool name box scratcher too. Yeah. Yeah. Lib Tech came up with that one. Pete came up with that one. And then, they just slapped my name on it after a couple of years. And then we added sizes and stuff and, and, uh, it, it's ongoing and, uh, yeah, Reese and Pika are going to do the next graphic, but and, it's not yours or but it it's is, not mine. So cause you had 12 years with it. Yeah. So it's a long run. Yeah. A little too long. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> some, some might say, yes. some might say, you know, <laughs> but you know, whatever you, you wake up and you're like, wait, Pro model board. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh-oh. <laughs> but uh, you know, everyone's uh, those guys that are just like Pete. You know, it's like, no, you're still just killing it. And I'm like, dude, come on, buddy. Like, it's all good. But uh, he's just got nothing but love for me, which feels great. And um, yeah, and and you know, now with Christina, it's still doing it, and and Reese collabing on the graphic and, and taking it and running with it it's like it's pika's pro model now it's still burton or box scratcher you know oh facts. <laughs> yeah facts. <laughs> which is awesome so <laughs> dope yeah seems like mervin's just a good you guys got a good vibe going on over there yeah yeah you know it's like it's it's been amazing i've been in house there for 10 years now um like not as a writer but as an employee and it's been it was always sort of like the plan i think from the second I got invited to be on the team was like, Oh, this is the place where I could actually like stay. And it felt like, Oh, I should just hang on to this no matter what, you know? And it, it, it has everything to do with the uh, Mike and Pete, Mike Olson and Pete, sorry, the founders. And they're just like these two just Willy Wonka types that are just like created this thing and it just swirls around them and they, they pull they pull talented people in, artists, writers, engineers, and just like their energy is infectious. And so it's really cool like that. 100%. It's cool with Lib has, you, you know, yourself and then you have your Jamie Lynn's, you know, and it's got that Northwest like Ripper and, and with Mervin and, he, you know, then you got Jamie Anderson on GNU and Blake Paul. And it's just like, it's such a cool group of humans uh, it seems like you guys got a good camp over there. Yeah, definitely. And everything kind of comes together like naturally. We try to just like follow like the currents of what's going on. And like, you, it's a, it's kind of amazing how much stuff comes about like through serendipity and, and you're just like, it just works out like that, you know? And, and uh, yeah, it's just, you got to kind of see it to believe it <laughs> yeah, that it's real. So it's, it's cool. You should come, people should come visit. Good stuff. Well, we haven't talked about the fact that we've spent a bunch of time together and a big role in your life has been uh, Mount Hood and coaching. And you've gone on to coach, I think, Zach Marvin, Eric Jackson, Pat Moore. Yep. Uh, what kind of role has High Cascade played in your career? Oh, man, it was huge. I mean, all of us. 
I mean, dude, once again, I'm just so lucky to have been there at the moment it popped, you know? Like, we were there the moment it popped. And, like, just to be there for all of that was just insane. And, like, Preston's energy and, you know, just what got created there. Government camp in those years were just brands were born <laughs> overnight and <laughs> and just became, like, household names within a year or two. Like, Air Blaster, Dang Shades, and multiple others, you know? Just, like, it's just, you know... It's the uh, uh, the petri dish. I'll use that one again. The petri dish of of brand building and snowboarding, and uh, the camp had one hundred percent everything to do with that. And uh, yeah, it's just and finding riders and filmers and stuff. Just like everything started there. It was like, who's gonna be in? The, oh, look at that guy. You know, like that's like I just saw Scott snowboarding. I didn't know anything about that guy just like whoa who is that you know i had no idea who he was he wasn't on any radar of mine maybe he was doing good in rail contests on the east you know i had no idea i just saw him at hood i was like dude this dude is psycho we need him you know cold turkey asked him to film for the video just like don't care what your sponsors are whatever you, you can be in the video you know which one is the first one that he was in Patchwork. Patchwork, yeah. He yeah. just threw a yes down on the spot? Yeah. He was just hyped? He's on Academy in Patchwork, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That was a good grab right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was it was huge. I didn't even really n- understand how big it was until um, later. Like, because when you think about it like that, like Gus Engel had just come off filming like a great part in Cue the Birds, and it was like really like we were all ready for – a change like Gus uh, was already doing his thing. Like he was expressing himself in like all sorts of new ways and it was happening really quickly. And it was like, Oh, I want to get on this energy, you know? And then Jeno was like, Oh yeah, I'm going to totally switch up my game the way I snowboard. Like it's going to be different. And, and, you know, I wanted that. And Micah was, was at his prime right there with creativity. And we were just like, why aren't we doing what he does? snowboarding you know and then and then uh, and then pulled scott in i didn't even know what we had pulled in but like we already had like momentum to be like to create something new we were like okay let's do art but through snowboarding like let's we were doing snowboarding normal snowboarding and dressing it up with an artistic concept let's actually make the snowboarding like performance art more you know really really like rip the like take the take the uh, chains off it you know like really let it free and then um and then scott came in and we didn't even know what that could look like really we were doing stuff like gus was really expressing and and doing we were like really going esoteric with it and like very weird and scott came in from a different direction that was like more athletic <laughs> like it was like <laughs> whoa okay there's a whole another and so it really became like this thing where we were coming at it from different angles which felt really cool because like you know I'll say jenna was really doing it like from this purest he wasn't gonna go like one footer or he did a little bit of that stuff but he was like really approaching it from way more of like a really coarse gate vibe he was like i'm gonna nolly a bunch of stuff and like it was like cool so now we have all these different angles that we're gonna approach the video from and that really and scott really became like the major one of those major angles which was cool i think it's fascinating looking at he's you're a big mentor to him and i think about the two people i know that maybe nerd out on videos the most out of anyone i've ever met in my life i feel like he's number he's probably number one and you're right there with him and so yeah. that you put you two guys together and start talking videos. It's like you guys can get real nerd deep on stuff. And, <laughs> yeah. And it's really cool. It's a really cool to nerd on stuff. I remember like mind blown being when I first met him, we'd be filming skating and, you know, he'd be doing a three flip in a line and I'd be filming next to him and he'd be like, hey, like go to the front a little bit more on the three flip. It'll just look better if you're kind of filming like a little bit more for towards the front. And you're like, okay, cool. But, like, the, all those little intricacies of how to film a clip. And yeah. You two guys get together, and it's, it must be just wildfire. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely. 
Yeah, we definitely. And we have like really similar opinion, which is kind of surprising. <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys notice this, but you like talked about an edit comes out or something and you, you will get a different opinion from like every single person you talk to about like a snowboard edit. Yeah. It's like, dude, that was sick. And like, what? That was the worst thing I ever saw. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> and like, <laughs> but like Scott and I weirdly are like always like agreeing. We're like, yeah, actually respect to that guy. And that was sick. Or like, actually that fell flat to me. You know, it's like interesting. Similar wavelength. Totally. And I think there's also something really, the, the thing that's really good you notice is like finding the good and stuff. You know, you, it depends on who you get with. Some clicks are going to rip stuff to shreds. Some people are going to hate on everything. They just love it, right? And, and then yeah. I feel like generally um, you're going to find, Scott finds the good in it. You guys find the good in it. Yeah, you can find the good in it. But you can also rip it to shreds. Yeah. Snowboard <laughs> hell, dude. Sometimes together. That's how you find snowboard hell. You know about snowboard hell? No. I don't know about snowboard hell. Buds, you know about snowboard hell? You've definitely been there. I, oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> what is it? Give it to us. Well, all year you're like ripping stuff to shreds, you know, like you're clowning this. You're, yeah, I can't believe I did that, you know, like whatever, whatever. And then you'll find that one day of the year where like it's the worst day ever. And you're just, that's your penance. You're paying for all the shit you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it's called snowboard hell. Snowboard hell. Yeah, Geno, it's a Geno concept. It's a great concept. That's a really good concept. We, f- we found it. We found it in Alaska. Uh, everyone in Think Tank knows about it. Like where you're like, it snows like, you know, two feet, and then it gets warm for like an hour, and then it gets cold again, and there's like oh, a solid like inch of ice crust that like you're, but you can't stay on top of it. You go under, but then you get a shinner from ice, and then you tomahawk. <laughs> And you've got like an entire mountain to get down. You're like, we found it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is our hell. moment, dude. <laughs> it's no more to hell. We're in it. We're paying for all of our sins. So we've had some good conversations about snowboarding and uh, I'll say etiquette in its past. Um, what What's your take on, on some filming etiquette stuff? Um. Yeah, I got a I got a gear to grind here. <laughs> <laughs> you got a bone to pick. This really grinds my gears. <laughs> no, uh, I feel like there's. I feel like we were all filming. We were everyone was filming video parts so much, and that a lot of that is eroded with the crews kind of going away. And there's a lot of just kind of like unspoken stuff that's like still floating out there. Um, that's like you guys don't know not to do this. Oh, you may, maybe you don't know, like no one's telling you, you know, but one for me and, you know, um, I'm going to be like kind of salty old snowboarder, but is like barging a session or like even asking to like get in on a session if people are filming and have set like a feature up that like seems to be like something that people just do now. And I've just been thinking about like, how that just does not work out for you. If you're serious about like getting in and like getting to be part of a film crew or a crew at your mountain, that's like out stacking, like what they don't want is someone coming up and doing better than them on something they worked hard to set up. Like that's not going to help you. So like, what are you trying to prove by doing that? Like if you really want in, like you need to take a different approach. <laughs> and like, yeah. Like for example, like, Let's say you show up and you're like, you're like, hey, can I hit this? And, you know, someone might be, they might say, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> you know, like, but they don't really mean it. But then you're like, they're doing a, you know, a nose press and then you're like, switch nose press. You know, like, what are they going to say about you later on like the drive home? You know, like, what would you like? Uh, the direct words would be "fuck that dude." <laughs> well, yeah, kind of like read the room, man. How can you? Not, yeah, like how can you not know that you can feel the vibe? Usually, like how can you not n- pick up on it? You know? Which yeah, is like sure, man. Yeah, like you know? how are you not gonna like? They're not gonna have a positive <laughs> takeaway from you, you know? So like, what did that do for you? Like, everyone can do a switch nose press. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, no. But anyways, not trying to make fun of my own analogy. Switch nose presses are awesome. <laughs> but like you know what i'm saying like it's not really it's like these people they've come together to do something in that moment so like really if you want to get in you should like help like and be like hey man like oh what are you guys doing like like this is sick like do you need me to like shoot another angle or like 
or help shovel or anything or like, you know, like, or read the room and just bail. But like, you know, if you know someone there, like, Hey, Hey Chris, like, what do you guys have? Oh, we're filming. Cool, man. You want me to like, you know, just start shoveling, helping, whatever, you know? And like, let's say you, you, you do that. And then, you know, and then at the end of the session, they're like, yeah, you want to hit it? And you're like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing to say. <laughs> you probably. know, like, nah, dude, this is your guys' thing, you know? It's all good, you know? That was super fun. That was a sick trick you got, you know? Like, what are they going to say about you on the drive home? They're going to be like, that kid was solid. You know, like, that was awesome, you know? Like, and then, you know, they're going to think about you the next time they go to shoot, you know? Like, like yeah, we should invite him. He helps. He helps, you know? And then, like. Yeah. What about when it's not a switch nose press and it's like they're trying some crazy ass trick that's never even been tried before, like rodeo off a roof. Saw a kid tr- do that on a Dylan Thompson session, and it was insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just jumped up on there, and you're like, dude, is this guy gonna die? In well, that's usually the guy that's gonna come do is that. So, die? like, <laughs> it's even worse because then you're like, cool. Let's say you're in the back country and you barge someone's scene, and you're trying to triple flip, and you yeah. land on your neck and neck. you have to get hellied out it's just like dude this is not how you do it you know yeah the the point i'm hearing too it's like a great thing to highlight it's just like it's also a lot of work that goes into just getting to trying a trick so being the person with the plan or being the person that's down to help shovel is a humongous part of being a snowboarder aside from just the person that does the trick yeah exactly you gotta like earn your time to be the guy that does the trick like it's like being like in any, it's like being a chef or something or like anything. It's like, you got to earn your time to like in front of a camera, you know, with a crew and it it won't take very long. (laughs) This isn't like a master class. It's just like (laughs) being a cool, mellow person a couple of times. This is just like FYI for anyone that wants to get in with people filming at your local resort. Like, yeah. And then the next, you know, let's say you go out and you do the right thing and they're cool and they're like man this guy's awesome and then the next time they're like hey you should come out with us like what you're going to want to do then is you're going to be like hey should i i have a video camera should i bring it like oh yeah and then obviously hey i'm going to run to my car and get my shovel because if we're going filming we're going to be building and i'm going to have a shovel you know pro tip yeah pro <laughs> tip so like now you're in now you're part of the crew now you can start filming a video part Great advice. Great Shovel, advice. a.k.a. Robert Shuval. Shuval. So I got I to gotta ask, are your team manager now, you know, Lib Tech, there's a lot of a lot of kids. They want to get sponsored. They want to get, they want to become uh, Actually, I'm a marketing director. Are you? Ooh. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, let me, I take it back. <laughs> marketing, marketing directors don't like Mervin, to team managers. Mervin Manufacturing Marketing I'm, I, I apologize, Jesse. Uh, <laughs> so you Ooh. are a marketing director. Uh, there is somebody well below you that is a team manager. Way, way, way down Way down, down like Name's basically Al. in the basement. <laughs> yeah. Literally like entry level position. Maybe four levels down. Borderline intern here. Um, <laughs> and they, But what my position is, being somebody that's in a position at a brand, what do you look for? in scouting talent of like oh this is the new person that we're gonna put on oh my god i was like should have like mentally prepared for this question i like i was on my things to do list <laughs> but i like, did not get around to it <laughs> um shit man it's just a tough grind out there it's guys. a hard-hitting question <laughs> yeah it's a tough grind out there it's a hard knocks world um in <laughs> snowboarding but i mean i'm looking for I'm looking for communicators. I'm looking for message. Everyone's pretty darn good. Um, so there's other things that, that you have to do, you know, and, 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 and then there's vibe of the brand and then there's, and then there's team and there's proximity to, to team and, and to our scene, you know? So all of those things come into play. It's like, and there's no easy answer and there's no formula, which is frustrating, but there is no formula. <laughs> And so it's like, are you available? <laughs> are you easy to work with? Do you rip? Do you really rip? Are you bringing something new that like hasn't been brought? Because like you've said before and others have said, like, you know, to be the pros are doing what the pros do. So if you want to be, you got to do better than them, you know, and that's been the, that's the way it is. The, the younger generation has to come in and burn down the older generation. <laughs> 
<laughs> eat eat them alive, you know? That's how you get your spot. <laughs> it's the only way. It's great advice. It's the only way. But, yeah, I mean, like, so much of it is a tricky mix of marketing and communication that's, like, you got to have a message that's communicable that the company can latch on to and, and, and they can easily communicate that's going to sell some boards. Yeah, that's a great breakdown. It's interesting compared to other sports like basketball or something. It's like, if I just average 30 points a game and work hard, I'm going to make millions of dollars in the NBA, whatever. It's like kind of, it's yeah, kind of analytical. You're a cog. You can be a cog in a machine. Yes. Yeah. So where there's, like you said, no formula. Like yeah. it's kind of this intangible flavor that you can't put your finger on and articulate. Yeah. You can kind of be a cog in a machine that like fills, if the machine is looking for that, like, oh, I just need a guy that's going to like check off a bunch of boxes and like rip, you know, and you can get in there like that but it doesn't always work out like that you know you a lot of times you have to you have to invent you have to invent a character <laughs> the formula is to have your own formula yeah you have to yeah exactly a new formula <laughs> Good, I, yeah that's well put you have to like invent like a a character that that the snowboard industry can't live without yeah that needs that character like somebody like freddie perry <laughs> yeah, well, I can't live without. Food, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the snowboard industry can, <laughs> but dude, <laughs> the world, the balance, the chi of the world yeah. is balance is entirely relying on Freddie Perry. <laughs> but like, I don't know, you know, there's some people out there that just really speak to other snowboarders, and and there's people that speak to a wider audience. And, and even the ones that speak to the widest audience in pro snowboarding are only speaking to a tiny bit of the audience. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so we're only still talking about a small percentage. Like snowboarding business is happening at the ski areas, the country clubs. And it's just sort of so much of it's happening no matter what we do. No matter what goes on this wall, it's just charging along. And we're just like dealing with like the very pinpoint of it, the best part. No, the the nucleus or whatever you. I mean, in our selfish worlds, maybe I, we view it as a nucleus. Maybe it's not. But it, I've come to realize with this show, snowboarding is small. Yeah, at least the way we like to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. You got a small community. That's why Travis Rice is so rad because he took like our small community and like broadcasted it out to like the largest audience it's ever seen, and mm -hmm. uh, like. So like that's you know that was like a um, non sequitur but um <laughs> non sequitur <laughs> yeah definition yeah like I, there was, that was not in sequence I just oh, kind of non sequitur <laughs> yeah brought <laughs> okay. brought, brought T Ricky into it like but just like that's what I always you know like he t like what we do is film video parts and and go for it from a cultural standpoint and Travis did that and like elevated it so it was like conan's talking about a video part yeah <laughs> which is so sick you know but like um but that those are very rare you know and that's what brings more people into the sport and makes it a or art or whatever you want to call it and i call it a sport and they're not sure. seeing the olympics they're seeing a video part so that's important yeah it's different yeah it's definitely all right i got some hard hitting for you ready yeah so i noticed when you break down your breakdown of snowboarding and making videos you're pretty deep and philosophical it appears to me uh i know that you read what do you read oh big um question yeah well i've actually been on like a big nonfiction kick i've actually been reading american history lately <laughs> but um so i've actually kind of out of the uh, philosophy realm right now but like reading um American history, and when I say American history, I mean indigenous American history, and uh, backing up and doing like pretty much mostly books about uh, Indian um, communities in the history of a lot of it in Seattle. That's sick. Yeah, it's been really, really fun. I just like, I've just been following a thread, like, and actually it's taken me in different places, but it's been sort of focused on indigenous peoples and then and i just read a book and wherever it leads me i go but yeah i've been it's loving pretty it cool because there's a history that has been tried the people tried to wipe it away oh my god dude it's such 
a mind blower. Yeah. It's such a big um, scar on the consciousness of our country, actually. And now they're finally realizing that and trying to preserve it now and get it out. Yeah, I mean, just I think just the as right an people, individual, just taking it in and kind of coping with the truth of American history is really important for every American, and you don't have to come out of it like it's not you know, to come out of it as some sort of America hater, it's to like understand reality and just be able to move forward with the information you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so. a great perspective. I think that's really, that's a very, um, mature and, um, neutral perspective. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, cause it can, it can go a lot of different dire directions. Yeah. Uh, what about, all right, so you, you've read a lot in your life. Do you have, like, if you could recommend one book to people, it, who, what would you what would you say your favorite is or most impactful? Oh, man, why don't you read uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel? <laughs> because that's the book that we, like, based Cue the Birds off of. Oh, really? And so you could kind of, like, it's like a book you would maybe read in high school, but it's, it's always fun for a reread. It's about a freestyle seagull that's, like, it's about a seagull that doesn't want to just, he doesn't want to just, like, go and, like, scavenge for food he wants to go fast his whole thing in life is to go fast and he actually ends up sort of like breaking like some sort of time barrier or something like it's fiction or non-fiction fiction, fiction. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, a true story it's about a seagull that told told us what he was going on in his mind yeah yeah that would be a fun one to to read um i don't know i'm kind of like just when i think about books to read well, you should read the Indigenous People's History of the United States. That's the one book you should read. I've heard that mentioned Solid. before from people. Yeah. And Jonathan Lewis <laughs> 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 and a nonfiction. Uh, <laughs> and actually, you know, like birds. read like uh, read Siddhartha, Herman Hess. Oh, that's a cool good Rex. Yeah, both short. Oh, read um. No, oh, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do book club. Away. We're doing yeah. book club. Jo read George Orwell. Read anything by George Orwell. Yes. Yeah. Chris only likes self help though. He's not gonna get into a lot of those books. Uh, I'd say. Well, I don't know about self help. Non fiction. Not self help, but yeah, non fiction. I like autobiographies and yeah, whatever, yeah, stuff like that. Um, but it, yeah, that, that indigenous indigenous book it falls under that category. Yes. Of non fiction. Oh yeah, read it. So yeah. Uh, okay, let's keep it moving here. Quick Patreon question? Yeah, hit a Patreon. All right. Let's go. This is from Sean Callaghan. How did you develop your filming slash editing style? Who are your biggest creative influences in this area? And whose work do you currently admire and get influence from? That's an awesome question, Sean. Um, I developed my style off of being pretty... Um, purposely amateur <laughs> like i've always wanted to keep there like take have no barrier between the filmer and the moment so like i don't i've never been a fan of production value <laughs> I think not a big fan of the dolly i imagine <laughs> dude <laughs> i can't take the dolly <laughs> there's a time and a place for everything <laughs> and we've gone in we've gone in on some stuff like that but like the dolly for dolly's sake is a travesty and the drone for drone's sake is yeah. a travesty anything that's calling itself out is like 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 the purpose for this is that we use this to me that's you you put a barrier between between the moment and the viewer so like just giving all those all those barriers and letting the viewer feel like they can feel the energy just like the energy needs to be as close to the viewer as possible and then like i'm such like a Again, I'm, I love everything too much that my edit style is like, I don't want to bore people, but I want to put everything in. <laughs> so I'm just going to you know, like, get as many clips in as possible. And then just like, no time for slow-mo. Sorry. <laughs> you know, like quick style. Yeah. Quick style. And I think for that, it's like, I got to shout out zero probably like, dude, Jamie Thomas's edit style. I mean, so much from skateboarding, but like, yeah, I would say like watching a zero intro. I, I we pulled some cues from that, like hard decisions. Like, okay, we're gonna use your clip once. 
that clip goes once in the intro really quickly. And nowhere else. Nowhere else. You know, it's like, damn, baller move. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> that so, is a baller move. Yeah. So stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I Keep used to be a more. habitual clip watcher, and it's really interesting. You break down, let's take, like, a part in a Mac Dog movie. There's there's some parts, backcountry parts that are 14 shots. Yeah. You go out, you get 14 shots, and that's a three-minute part, broken down with lifestyles, slow-mos, all that, 14 shots. That's not including? That's like, no, no, just like 14 shots? snowboard action shots. Yeah. Um, probably average around 20. Yeah. Probably an average for... Now, there's video parts in Think Tank that I've counted that are over upwards of 60 clips. Yeah. Yeah. That's like just to break it down. Like that's heavy. That's two different styles of editing. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're Lucas um, Huffman, you're, one of your shots took like if nine. If you're jumping 100 feet. <laughs> it took like nine <laughs> seconds because you were in the air the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long shot. Yeah, like my, my kickflip hippie hop went by like that. You, know? <laughs> you need seven of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need seven of my clips for every Huffman shot. Yeah. <laughs> the one clip of Gus Engel humping the teddy bear with the shame on it took actually two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the best clips yeah. ever. See, that's, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You got to make room for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bertner, let's get into a little bit of, uh, I want to maybe do a little bit of debunking. Oh, yeah. I like debunking stuff. I don't stuff. know if this is debunking. Let's debunk. Let's talk one foot. Oh, yeah, let's, let's do talk, it. Let's, let, let's talk We're about letting the hoof the breathe. Let's, yeah, let's debunk it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about putting a defibrillator on that back <laughs> hoof and literally letting that thing just... Breathe. Burger yeah. out of the bun scenario. Yeah. So did the inspo come from Micah Hollinger? Uh, for one footing? Mm, yeah, you know, probably. Because <laughs> he I was mean, doing the one foot front boards and stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that was definitely part of it. It was like, yeah, it was that fall leading up to patchwork patterns. Gus Angle moved in with me and Pika. And we were just, okay, I got to mention Baker 3 came out. So we got to mention Baker 3. We're on like the Cue the Birds premiere tour. Baker 3's out. Thinking about what's next. What are we going to do? Almost threw in the towel for Think Think. Like Pika and I were like, dude. You were going to stop doing it? We were like, because we like did not succeed on Thunk. We did not succeed on Cue the Birds and uh, we succeeded. Just not a lot of numbers out? Yeah. Not a lot just, of money made. Yeah, no money made, no numbers, not getting very good numbers, just kind of people were liking the movies, but it was just like, okay, how much? You know, let's do another one, you know? And yeah, and then we were just, I mean, it was really Micah's skating. We were watching it, talking to him about it. And watching the kits in Baker 3, the energy, how anything's a clip, how they freed the, the form, the form sort of became freer looking and like, just like, okay, there's more room to express if you kind of go in this direction. And then, and then what's, what's back on the table? If we're talking about everything you can do on a snowboard, what's on the table, you know? And so it was just like one footing was obviously on the table and it was really Gus at the first part of the year. Um, I was really just about doing unstrapped tricks. I wasn't really, I was like, mm, one footing. I'd never done a one footer. Like hadn't messed with it at all. Who I was doing them heavy at the time. In snowboarding? Yeah. Dude, I don't know. Hakey Sorsa. All right. Like, I mean, I think Hakey and then, you know, pretty quick after that, Tadashi. Um little bit of Mueller. Mueller. I remember around. Palmer way back. Palmer. One Palmer out. was amazing, yeah. Palmer, um, Cebu, Kohlberg had a couple. Definitely not everybody. No, it was always just kind of a sideshow. Yeah. I mean, I never even thought about it in the whole time I snowboarded. Yeah. And like, I, like, avoided it. Yeah. I was like, oh, here, I strap in on the lift. At Baker, you had to strap in on the lift. The, oh, you do? Yeah. The, the, the outs were so steep and gnarly that everyone just sort of strapped in on the lift. Well, like getting off the lift? Yeah. And so you're like, it was like a rite of passage to be like, and also they were like, not about like, if, like you don't wait for each other. You just go. Yeah. So like, you just, so if you have to strap in, you're going to get left. 
So you had to learn how to like lean over. Uh, lean over, get your <laughs> binding, you know, strap it. Was there no uh, foot foot bar? <laughs> no. Okay. And so you're just, anyway, so I was like, yeah, I strap in on the lift. I don't one foot. I, I chuck off jumps, you know. I go straight and chuck. I I'm go a fast. Jumper. I'm a jumper. <laughs> yeah. I go real fast. And then, you know, I think um, Gus, like, started, I was just trying to do, like, kickflip stuff and loving that. And then Gus started, like, doing more of the one foot stuff the first half of the year. And um, he did some that I just thought looked so sick. Like he does this little one at Diamond High School in Anchorage, just over a trash can, and he's got like the, out, the outfit. You know, it's amazing, and the way his one foot style is great. And um, and then it just was like I, I, I think I'm gonna. I think one day I was just on top of, I was on top of, uh, I was on top of a cliff <laughs> at Baker. And I was just like, dude, I'm going to just do this one footed. What size are we talking here? I don't know. It was like, it was like 15 feet or something. It's in the video. It's in Patrick okay. Patterns. Yeah, dude, nose grab. I think I got it second try or something. And was like, wow, that was like a fun and it was a rush and it worked. And that was a thing that was like, it works so good. Like, it works insanely good. Like, why is it this gone in more directions? It like really worked. <laughs> like, like I think you could pretty much do anything you want <laughs> one footed. You know, like you could do any snowboard trick one footed, possibly. You know, and that's sort of like how it got like really getting into it. You know. Yeah, and then I've you heard guys, guys like Bodie say it's not that hard once you get into it, but it looks so hard. And it Bo took a guy like Bodie to really Bodie really pushed it to another stratosphere. Scott's done some crazy Bodie. stuff, huge, yeah. huge, huge. Bo Bodie is like the guy that like took it where like my brain was going, which was like, could you do, you know, you could do a back ten double cork one foot, you could, like someone could do that. There's there's a kid out there. These kids are so good. That would, there's a kid out there that could put that down, you know, and it would be gnarly. Don't get me wrong, dude. You get worked, but I mean, the one footed double flip is a savage one. It's so savage, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, and it just played into like where we were going. Was like we wanted to be different, and so that was the first thing. It's like no one's really doing this right now. Like let's do it. We're not gonna just, and then like just apply it to different terrain like oh okay it just hasn't been done in the back country that much so like i'm gonna like do this down pillows i'm gonna do this you know like and then tadashi came out pretty quick and did a sick one in a whiteout movie where he like cracks it off a cornice or something and then like kind of loses loses it and then goes into a, a a ground 360 and pulls out and it looks amazing and like that was like right around the time I started doing them. And I was like that it, he's already there. Like, I want to do exactly that, like exactly what he just did. Like I want to chase that, you know? And, and then like, I'm such a fakey spinner. Cab. Cab. <laughs> I'm such a fakey. I'm such a jalapeno Cab. toe popper <laughs> <laughs> that like, uh, you know, I'm like strictly toes and like, and I had never seen anyone really do like, fakey stuff one footed and i was like and then when i applied my jalapeno tactics to it it worked you know and i was like oh i could do a fakey 540 with my foot out you know and i was like you know you got to be a toe popper <laughs> to so, pull that off did yeah. you find that these tricks were the the premier pleasers that you were looking for yeah they seem some like crowd them. pleasers you know one footers some of them, yeah. Some of them are so weird and like random and desperate looking that they don't really <laughs> translate. They did translate. <laughs> yeah. But like some of them for sure, you know, like, yeah, definitely some premier cheers in there. I always found it interesting how you guys, you had parameters around the one footer though, too, because you look and, you know, Jeremy Jones was doing the spinner. And I always was under the impression that your parameters or maybe no board modifications yeah that's my rule that was a rule yeah i sort of made the rule like because yeah i was looking at it like i want this to fit into my philosophy of snowboarding so i guess i did have like i have just made my own weird rule that was like this is how i get on the lip why am i doing this 
Like you're supposed to have both feet in. Oh, well, when you get on a lift, you have one foot on. Okay. So I do one foot every day. I get on the lift. So what if you just didn't put that other foot in when you got off? That's what this is. I'm just like, and so I just applied that concept to it all. I only ever have the right foot in and the left foot out. I don't do any tricks with my left foot in and my right foot out. I would never get on a lift like that. That's my rule. That was like, a rule. Yeah. That's not anyone like, and, and then like, yeah, board modification. Like what I, I'm just like into like one tool to rule them all. Like, what can you do with this one thing? Like you could, if you had the thing at the top of the mountain, you could rip some powder, you could drop a cliff, you could ride the half pipe. And then when you got to the parking lot, you could do a kickflip. Like how sick is that? <laughs> like with this one thing, you know, I can do it all. I can like surf, you know, skate ski <laughs> you know so that's that's the philosophy super interesting very interesting what's your philosophy on the prop comic the what's the prop, prop comic? comic well we used to i mean steven's we do he had he had that, he used to store all kinds of items <laughs> by his shed <laughs> pulling stuff out he used to have like uh, the old trusty spool the old the uh, cones of prop. trampoline yeah no i like the i mean it's just energy energy my rules like go out the door when with you know scott brings so much energy to every scenario that like it just looks amazing so like but i'm down for the props i'm down for like something that is just making a statement like i like that stuff sometimes you know you get a call from stevens i got a mattress i'm bringing to this spot or a couch the thing is is he's going to use it in like an amazing yeah, way he'll figure something sick out it, <laughs> yeah you use it in a cool way you know you don't just like have it like necessarily sitting there you know we did yeah. that for Patrick. Some just like that cone, just like in the mix, you know, just keep it in the mix, you know, like, and, but like, those aren't, those were like, you know, like environmental shots that just kind of like push the movie along. But like when it came to like getting a clip, if there's a prop involved, it's got to be a major participator in mm -hmm. the clip, you know, the cone became the think thought, think, think icon. Yeah. It was cone shovel picnic table Yeah, there you go. was like, were the three, those were like tools the, of the trade yeah like if you had a cone a shovel and a picnic table you could have a whole movie it was like and so the, the cover of patchwork is jeno like like the shovels leaning against the picnic table and the cones there and he's like tail blocking on top of it and it's like they're all there um but cone really like raised up and became like the, the figurehead Love it. <laughs> do you feel like it boosted people's accessibility to snowboarding like it, a lot of people gain interest have you heard from people that are like oh i got into snowboarding because these videos seemed accessible oh totally like so many backyard borders and stuff and like people from um smaller mountains and midwest and east coast and and just random kind of backwatery zones you know they're just like well i can like i can recreate like all of this and in, <laughs> in my little zone you know and that yeah we hear from people like that a lot and also like you know, we went right into the recession and, and we were kind of like recession proof snowboarding too, because it was like, well, this is, you want to have a snowboard season, like in a recession, like this is all you need. You, you know? don't need a lot. Yeah. You don't need a lot. Like shovel cone table. You ba yeah. barely need the board. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, what about the kick flips and stuff? What's your philosophy on all that? Um, the kick flips, uh, my philosophy on that was like, holy moly, this is so sweet. We have about a year to do this before the big dogs come in and show us how it's really done. <laughs> Let's go as hard as we can and get as much as we can before, before, you know, Jeremy is going to be doing like a kickflip off a 10 set next year, you know, but it didn't go down like that. Um, but that actually the kickflip I like saw so long ago and like, you know, we definitely didn't invent that. And and um, actually, Mark Hibden was the first guy I saw do it. Really? Hibden? Yeah. Road Sick. from Movement. Yep, I remember him. Yeah, he was my coach at USSTC, and we were down at the bottom of Timberline there, and um, where you, when you walk in, we were all grouped up outside there on the cement. He, like, flicked one on the cement and took him a few tries, like, and then he did one. I was just like, whoa. I'm like, 13 years old or something and didn't think about it for years. I think Todd did one in Anthem maybe mm. on the snow with the heel cup and everything, which is pretty damn hard. The snow has got to be really 
firm to get that thing to flip. And then Sluggo did one like Sluggo like launched a kicker and just pedaled one. Mm. And I think Sexual Chocolate. I think you're right. Yeah. And uh, movie. so they were like out there, but they weren't, no one was really doing them. And that was like, I think Gus and my like priority number one. We were doing them in the yard leading up to Patrick. Like, and we were like, pulled a piece of plywood out. We were doing them on grass. And God, we were, I was definitely younger. Because I could do them really good now. It's like, <laughs> I would never, I need like just the right surface now to do one. But back then I could, you know, get that thing to go. No problem. Who are some notable uh, kick flippers that in the, in the age of snowboarding? Oh, I think, um, I think Gus Engel has the best, the first best kick flip done off the picnic table at Bear Mountain. And then I think the next, um, my next I think the next best kickflip done is Max Warbington um, when he did the body varial, or no, the shove it to kickflip in the chicken meat movie. And then I think uh, Chris Beresford in Alaska doing the switch kickflip off a of three stair in the strats. In the strats. 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 Thoughts. It was a Thoughts. heavy stretch you just threw down. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I think that. I think Beresford. Um, and then he did switch double flip that day, but he, like, kind of landed. It kind of didn't. But, like, dude. Yeah, those right there are my three favorite flip tricks of all time. All right, we got a couple guest questions left. Let's run through these kind of back to back. A little fire. Model. Bring it on. Fire. We'll go fire on the mountain. This one's from Micah Hollinger, a.k.a. Hollinger. Here we go. Sinister Bones. Hey, Bombhole. Stony Buds. Grandies. <laughs> Love the show. Big fan. I was wondering, what, what, who's at your left? Le- uh, uh, <laughs> look what the cat changed. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, looks like you have Jesse Burton in the hot seat, my longtime friend. Jesse, I have a question for you. Out of the 20 plus amazing video parts you've shot over the year, filmed over the years, uh, which one's your favorite? And give us a little insight. Why is your favorite? Um, yeah. Thanks for doing what you guys do. Love the show. Have a great day. Over and out. That was an insane guest question. Dude, Mike is the best. Um, Look what the cat dragged me. <laughs> what was the sinister bones in the beginning? That was me. Oh, that was me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know where that came from. I was like. What? That's one of his nicknames. Love it. Good nickname. Sinister bones. He's also known as the maestro. Yep. The maestro. <laughs> he doesn't like that one. No? <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, that's a tough one, man. Um, obviously, Thunk. But I'm actually going to go and give it to Stack Footy. Mm. I, share, I share the part, like Bogart's on the tail end of it, but um, I don't know if that matters. It doesn't matter. I don't think that matters. It's Rosen about the trick. It's about the trick. Yeah, like, I just think it, like, I was just really proud of that stuff that's the one where um i don't know what did i I had just this i did the cab nine rocket which is uh was a funny one but it went down and it was cool it's small but like it was just an awesome that day i did that and the back three off the cliffy cornice thing where like land and then recover and bounce again and it's like and that song was super fun and um, I had some one foot stuff in there like that I liked and it was all mixed together with like pretty good jumps, you know? So it was kind of like a good, like amalgamation of my different styles of snowboarding. Cause there was, there was creative stuff in there, but also jumps. Also things like rocket airs. Like yeah. Creative though too. That's a yeah, great, yeah. That's, that's a great creative think jump. era. The stack footy, the tapes smacking down on the, the motion graphics, which, Pika did the motion graphics. On, that's the, or who did the, uh, the actually, animations? Or art? Genevieve's. Genevieve's the motion. Well, Pika did the graphic design on the titles, yeah. and then Genevieve's and Andy Simitis, who's our good friend, who's helped pull off a lot of this stuff. Um, Are you talking Super Genius? Super Genius. Nice. Yeah, they they did those titling. They did that titling together. They like would stack the tapes and then drop a heavy object and like filmed it and like cut out the background and then like added those the titling that pika made 
Great concept. Yeah. Uh, Got to rewind to the look what the cat dragged in reference from Micah and that uh, when we lived together at Blue Roof with Micah and Scott, I think you were living with Pika right up the road. Yeah. Uh, High Cascade years, but he would walk in. Or anytime anybody would walk in the door at High Cascade, he'd go, look what <laughs> the cat dragged in. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we, that's a little that's backstory on that. Yeah. Pretty tight. <laughs> And yeah. we were filming for the session recap videos like it was zero fucking die trying, basically. <laughs> yeah, seriously, <laughs> so man. Yeah. We got a couple more guest questions we can try to run through rather quickly. This one's from another G, Chris Beresford. Here we go. Yo, Bombhole, this is Beresford calling in. Um, I got a question for Jesse about the, the skate banana era when those things were a super hot commodity. And I just remember... Jesse was just stacking some serious cheddar biscuits on the <laughs> skate banana side hustle. And uh, if he could go into it, I think it would be cool. And um, thanks for everything, Jesse. You changed my life. And I know you've changed a lot of others also. Have a good one. Bear Claw. Barry Manilow. <laughs> yeah. Um, Uncle Doug. Uncle Doug, yeah. <laughs> well. Montanasford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't know if I've heard that one, but I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, the skate banana hit like crazy. That was like right when I, so, you know, I wouldn't advocate for selling boards. I would. A, <laughs> as a pro rider, you know, but I was uh, not um, a sponsored rider right then. Okay. And uh, I was putting out Think Tank videos, working at camp, doing staff sales, and I had quite a few skate bananas in the old rocket box. And those things were, they held their value, let's say. Like a bit, it's like a modern day Bitcoin, basically. (laughs) Yeah, it was basically (laughs) like a Bitcoin. Yeah. It's a pro rider's right to be selling that, that gear out the box, you know? No, it is. It's cool. Um, I mean, it's awesome, but as long um, as it's not excessive and like, yeah, they were all sent to them legitimately. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah, it was all legitimate and it was, um, how I was making, making ends meet. So, and it's good to meet. It's yeah. Good. It's a way to pay a rider if you're not paying a rider too. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that worked out good that summer. And then I actually ended up getting back on as a paid snowboarder the next, by the next summer. And, uh, I like didn't, I was like done selling the boards. Sure. Or was I? Yeah. Did you give them to Bud's? <laughs> eBay. Bud's will sell just about anything he gets sent to. Yeah. That thing, any, any package that shows up, boom. Dude, no way. I'm a hoarder, dog. <laughs> <laughs> But it was yeah. pretty sweet though for a second, like with like let's talk bisque. Oh yeah, let's talk yeah, bisque. Let's talk yeah. a summer, bisque. summer of bisque. Let's yeah, talk bisque. Well, let's slanging like, them out the the, the uh, tax box. free, tax free. Yeah, yeah I mean like you, it was like you know you're you could get decent pay as a coach at High Cascade back then, and then you got money for every request, and I would get like a lot of requests, and then I was selling videos, so Think Tank was making money selling dvds and t-shirts and then the staff sale and so that could like add up to some decent bisque so you're gonna louis veto us yeah, you're, you're gonna, gonna give us a number, a number what do we I mean, need we need some time we need something to chew i don't on even here. remember but like you know you would make you could it's not a ton but you would make like you could make twenty five hundred dollars at a staff sale there we go that's some bisque that's now number. we're talking that's get, a solid so like a yeah number. you're talking about like you know like a summer where your a coach gets what what were we getting 325 a session or something but then you get the 25 i don't remember exactly that what makes it legit yeah but then you have a staff sale and you make thousands <laughs> it's like mccarthy's gonna get on here and talk staff sale bisque too talk bisque. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean that was a big how we got that house in glacier actually <laughs> from, from i mean one people, staff sale <laughs> dude people were like making their seasons out there beresford was making his season oh yeah yeah. yeah, Scrooge McDuck or Beresford? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we got another guest question from another talented writer that came up to Think Think, Jess Kamira. What up, Bombhole crew? It's Jess Kamira here calling in with a guest question for Bertner. So, Jesse, your approach to writing is so unique and so creative and so outside the box. And I'm just wondering... What inspired you to ride like that? Has it always been that way? Or did the head injury have something to do with you having to shift your focus on doing big, crazy stunts and kind of shrink it down to 
just being more creative and approaching things in a whole new way. Um, I know that it inspired a whole generation of snowboarders to also think outside the box, and I know it had a huge impact on me. So love you guys. Later. Oh, that was a sweet Jess Kamara question. Um, thank you, Jess. Uh, I'll answer that one by saying that, like, my journey after the head injury, um, I'll say that my journey through snowboarding has been, like, inward. Whereas, like, a lot of people go out, you know, to, like, quote, unquote, the ends of the earth. You know, like, get out there, like, go as far as you can, as big as you can, as high as you can, like... My journey has progressively become more in in my brain and like diving down into like into my soul through these some of these mini shred tricks they take they take you to a place that you didn't know you really meet your true self in there you know and people that film video parts are going to understand what I'm talking about you like have to like come face to face with yourself and you can get there quickly with these mini shred tricks, you have like no hike. You don't even have to strap in. So you're just getting into like this. It's just this battle where it's like this puzzle that you have to figure out. And then all of a sudden all the demons are talking and all the naysaying and you just have to, you just have to commit to the process and like, I'm going to stay in the process of getting this shot and just love the process. Like I love the battle. Thank you. May I have another, thank you. May I have another, you know, like, <laughs> And, like, when you're in that process, you really just, yeah, you meet, like, the proto you, you know, like, um, and that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty addictive, and that's, um, like, I think that's how I've, I think that's one of the big attractions for me with the mini shred, and, like, that's where it's taken me, and, and um, yeah, and that's why um, I found it interesting is because I was able to, like, able to go big by going tiny. <laughs> so thinking about your snowboard career, it's kind of had an interesting graph of ups and downs and ups. And it seems like you didn't really quote unquote, like make it in snowboarding till later. Yeah, that's a yes. And I didn't, did I make it? <laughs> like what is, you, making, what, is, yeah, what is yeah. making it? What, really make what it? is making it mean? Yeah. What, what does it mean? You know? And that's, uh, I think once I ch like changed my definition of making it, I started making it like I didn't really, I wasn't really making it trying to do a normal paradigm that other people had been successful in. And, um, I really decided that, you know, I owned my snowboard career and it wasn't up to somebody tell me I was a pro snowboarder, you know, or tell me that, you know, it wasn't the money or the sponsor or the sticker on my board that was going to define my career. It was like what I put out as a snowboarder, like the message I shared. And, and that was like me taking ownership of my snowboarding. Like, and that was an important thing for me because I, as soon as I stopped really caring about getting sponsored so much or hanging on to sponsors, I started getting sponsors <laughs> again, you know? So I did, I went through some ups and downs with that, but it was really just like finding my voice and my message. And then also like being like, you know what? I'm in this, like I'm a participant and a, you know, I'm, I'm at the table whether or not, you know, I get invited. <laughs> like I'm at the table, like I'm doing this. This is my life. I'm going to make videos and put out video parts and judge the, success of my career based off of those communications and like so like my career you know is ongoing because i'm still filming and stuff so it's cool because yeah i'm not like retired from filming snowboarding you know like getting going out and getting tricks it's just morphing and changing so really puts a different spin on it would you say that you're married to the game <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think i would say that like i didn't choose the game <laughs> but the game chose me <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff well, that's another mic this is i remember I micah shooting the intro it. to that <laughs> it took him like i remember watching the outtakes and micah trying to like do that and he would like blow the tries and be like i didn't choose the game the game chose me and start laughing <laughs> yeah yeah um, 
Okay, so moving along. You know, it's interesting. You know, you made your own lane there. You're talking about you kind of you forged your own path because it didn't exist. Great, great thing to highlight. However, you mentioned making it going pro. What is what does going pro even mean in snowboarding? Yeah, that's uh, that's a question that we all need to get on a sort of the same page about because there's a lot of like confusion and there's like a there's definitely like a you know a, a um, expectation from this general area geographically of the world that we're Salt in Lake right City. now. Salt Lake City, yeah, that is like one thing. Whereas like it's different everywhere else. Well, can you can you lean into that and explain? <laughs> well, I just think like you can't like snowboarding is different than skateboarding, and you know historically there's lots of pros that don't have their name on a board. And so I just think it's interesting that now there's sort of a expectation that you need to have your name on a board to be considered a professional. And, um, that's just not happening from like a sheer, like economic perspective, you know, a snowboard is, um, or maybe it could happen. I'm actually opening it up for discussion, but, um, you know, it's, it's a way different item than a skateboard. One's, $55 $55 with grip and one's like 600 bucks without bindings, you know, like it's just a different scenario. And, um, so it's interesting that like, so what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It just means, it means, <laughs> it means you gotta be, you, you're on the list. You're on the, I think that's what it means. You're to on me. the, so you're on the website under pro category. Yeah. That's what it means. You're on the list. You're actually, yeah. You're listed. Your company saying you're a pro. Yeah. So you said Salt Lake has a different thing. I thought it was the cool guys in Seattle that chose. Who was I always thought the skateboarding name on the board. Yeah. But here's the thing. This is the way I think companies should do it, is that maybe they don't make a production huge run of the pro models for everybody that turns pro, but everybody that turns pro for a board, board uh, company, why not make a small release at least just to celebrate their pro? They used to say if you got paid money, you were a pro. That's what defines yeah, see, that's amateur like, from pro. That's where we're coming from. Is like, and the thing was, is the Olympics because you couldn't go to the Olympics if you were pro, and so it was like this thing that was very much like created a a very recognizable barrier that was like, okay, you're amateur until you do the Olympics, and this wasn't really for snowboarding; it's for other sports. But um, they had changed that by the time snowboarding entered the Olympics, but. I think that's where we get this like pro am feeling from is from the Olympics that like, okay, you just, you don't get paid as soon as you're in the NBA, you can't go to the Olympics, you know, like you now you're a paid, you're pro. So you're in the NBA, you don't do that anymore. And now that's totally changed. So like, yeah, when are you a pro is just such a interesting question. Like it should be, but I still think that just getting paid at all makes you a professional, right? That's what it seems like to me. That's what defines a professional out in a work market, you know? Yeah. So Amkid just signs with random company, let's say Vans. They start making $250 a month. They're 18 years old. They're pro? I mean, questionably. Yeah. They're on let's, the say, let's say in the photo world, well, I'm an amateur and a hobbyist. It could be a paid amateur. If I wasn't being paid, but if I'm making money, I'm a pro. So it, we still, so let's, we're basically, we don't know what pro is still. Let's, we're still unclear. <laughs> oh, we're so knows. unclear. The thing is, is like every company does it different. Like Mervin, we just have like team and everyone's listed. You don't have pro team. It doesn't say pro. Or does it say international? I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it does. It's and a then, question for the team ma- ma- manager well below you. <laughs> yeah. Really your yeah. salary. And then You're there's like that. more, like the more like, um, you know, the in the, the AM people are listed, you know, not featured and they're down below. And um, whereas like Burton has like a list of like 66 people just in, you know, like. They do. They're all in there together. Like one. I guess they're all pro. I don't. They're all getting paid, maybe. Yeah, I think we gotta we gotta get together. We gotta get a bunch of heads of the brands together, and just people and like and just have a, a meeting summit. in the minds and have a summit. And we gotta figure out what the hell it means to be pro in snowboarding because yeah. it's different brand to brand. It's different contest to contest. 
it's yeah, different. I'd love to do that just because I want to like, yeah, I want to, I think we need that because yeah, you're not going to be able to make, you could do something for somebody, you know, and like you can set it up that way. How, how about like, this? If you're making a living from it, it's the only thing you do that makes you a professional. But that's there, even but hard. That, there's to, that's even so people that are better than everybody that, that are better than everybody that are eating chowder. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. They aren't getting, and they got to get a side now. job all summer. Yeah. You're right. That doesn't work. So, it's okay. Like, take like one of your favorite pros from back in the day, and just they might not have had a model. Does that mean they weren't pro? You know? Uh, yeah, they I think should still be pro. There, yeah, there needs to be a pro in an am, like even global am pro, am or global am. That needs to be separate on the team. Yeah, let's let's keep things old fashioned. We're we're not we're let's keep let's follow like we always do. Follow skateboarding because they seem to do it right. Generally, yeah. and we'll just do that, and and then not have this weird. Just everybody's on, whether you've been snowboarding for a week or fucking your whole life, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There's got to be <laughs> yeah. separation. There we need, yeah, we need a uh, we need a summit. We need a summit, athlete summit, <laughs> yeah, or team manager team summit, manager marketing summit. summit. Yeah. All right, we'll keep things moving. We've and what, what's the point? Just so some kids can't call themselves pro, or they can. Well, it's just that there's a lot of it's amb- it's ambiguous in general. It's, it's just an ambiguous like, topic. Yeah, it's like when now when people say like, "Are you pro?" Like some people are like, "Well, I don't know." It's like when well, you get paid, you are pro. Well, I don't have a pro model. It's like okay. But like, I'll say this: Tommy Gesme. See, they made him like they made him a board that said that was like um uh basically a sleepwalker when he turned pro. They gave him a board. It was it was even like a it was like a five off, not a one off. They probably made five of them. Yeah. I thought it was a cool way to do it. That like, is cool. He did, yeah. It did wasn't an inline model, but he did have a Tommy Gesme board to hang on his wall. Yeah. And it's like something that's a cool way. And there was a celebration. There he was a doesn't moment. Have a pro model. There was a moment that said, Hey, we're doing Tommy Gesme's pro party. Yeah. And that's important. I think that that needs to be Somebody graduating from AM to Pro should be a celebrated thing because it's a big achievement. Yeah, and that's like what we did with like Ted and Reese, you know, and it was like really cool, it was and special, f- and special. Yeah, and then we actually like released the special graphic way, but it just gets to be so much when you're trying to like move someone into a scenario. There's just a lot of moving pieces when you're trying to make snowboards and and everything around it. So. I'm looking for a little help from my industry dogs. Let's get this thing a little yeah. sewn up. We need Jeno. We need uh, Marks. We need McCart. We need you guys. We need Zach Nigro. Get Blue Mont or we need Dangler. Sounds like a good question Dangler. of the week. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to get everybody in a room, make a little bit of a behind the doors Behind the scenes, a uh, Monopoly power play here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, Jeff Holst doesn't keep asking me when people are getting pro model boards. Is that what he does? <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point I'm asking this. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone, Jeff. All right, it's time for the pub beer crap shoot. Ooh. Here we go. Welcome to the pub beer crap shoot. All right, buds, you going to crack some can? Let's crack it. Oh yeah. yeah, let's sip it. He's gonna give it a little sip. Get that beard all sudsy. Cheap fun beer. That's their motto: cheap fun beer. If you want to get blacked out or just casually have a beer, get pub beer. They're great. Cheap fun beer. Delicious. Okay, roll a couple of those dice. Two, two. Yep. And uh, we'll tell you what you gotta do. Um, Goon gears a six. If you got one, it looks like you did. Yep. Ten. Ten. Perfect, Perfect ten. ten. What's the biggest prize check you've ever won? $7,500. Woo-wee! <laughs> That's biscuits. Two of those in a row. That's biscuits. <laughs> That's biscuits. That's what we call some biscuit chicken right yeah. there. That's good. Okay. Um, all right. We're cruising along. We're going to get into hot takes. But before we do, I know that you keep a running list of your favorite snowboards on your phone. Oh yes, running. Elaborate on running. That. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, I just, um, I just like it. I, I just like. Oh, I, I just want to remember the people that make me smile in snowboarding, and and also I just like that. There's like, people are like, who's the best? Who's the goat? Who's this? And I'm just for years now. I've been like, well, I don't really care. I mean, the, there's the goat is you know objective, but 
your favorites are subjective and no one can tell you anything about them. So I just like, who are my favorites? And I just started like organizing them on my phone like a few years back. And you don't knock people off. It's not like a top 10. I do knock people well, off. You do knock people Damn, off. Who's been knocked off recently? I wow. know, I uh, who who was the blood? last guy to get well, knocked off the list? <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'll, I'll tell you. I would love to know. <laughs> uh, just, yesterday, just yesterday, he had a quick little stint on the list, but I decided he needs to go back. Back to off Back the list. to the, uh, he needs to go back to the training grounds and put in a couple more years. But he popped up on the list and he popped off again. Mateo, my buddy Mateo Sultane. Peace to Mateo. He came on. He, he, was, he was living the good life. Mateo, right you were down. there, dude. But just, that's just the thing. You, you're you there for a little bit. You were there, dude. He was on the list. Yeah. You were there. You just, could come back. It's just a moment in time, you know. Like, you'll, he'll be back. You know, he'll be back. I but, love the people getting knocked off and put yeah. back. And, and actually, this sort of sadly... I think someone else got sad, sadly knocked off. What if somebody kind of slights you and kind of gives you a weird yeah. comment? Is that grounds to get knocked off yeah, the like list? They like were kind of cool list. guys you if they yeah. cool guy you on the chairlift? Mm. Are you like, oh, you're on my list. You know, now you're, you're off. off. That could happen. If I actually saw any pro snowboarders ever, that might happen. But I'm just <laughs> like in my own world. What, about, so. what if they bum you out on social media, nothing to do with snowboarding, they can get thrown off? Um, if it's enough, you could. when I read my list, you'll see that. They don't really get thrown off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear the list. But um, another one that just recently got knocked off that is sort of, he could always get back. He's got to just snowboard a little bit for me again. Jake Oe. Oh. Sorry, buddy. You just got knocked off the list. Oof. Yeah, you were. You were uh, on. You were on, yeah. And I love Jake, you'll always yeah. be on my list, buddy. Oh, great. Now, <laughs> here Jake, we you, go. Jake, you had, you had it all. We, the had, second, we, we hung out with him recently. I mean, it was Four months ago or so, but yeah, I love puts him right back on the list. I'll tell you what, yeah. he sent me a picture last week uh, remodeling his house wearing flip flops. So yeah. that's that'll put you right back on the I'll list. Get him back on. <laughs> the second half of this episode is when I piss everyone off. Okay, <laughs> yeah, let's get, yeah, let's the get first the half was all love. <laughs> <laughs> now we're into the uh, salty half. No, no, it's all love. But this list is 10, 10 all time favorite snowboarders. My opinion. So, oh, I have eleven on here. Someone's going to get knocked off today. Huh? <laughs> yeah. We'll do a vote off the island at yeah. the end. Let's read all 11. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy? read 11. We'll, vote, we'll vote somebody off. Okay, per- currently in 11, who I thought was 10, Jake Kuzik. Respectable. Yeah, I love Jake's style. He's, I, he's right there. Huh? I think he's so special. I love I think he, like, I, I call his um, style uh, empathetic. He has empathy on his snowboard. He's almost, like, apologizing to the features. And the landings, especially when he lands, it's like he's like sorry, and he kind of like pulls his board up a little bit right before he lands, and it's just like, oh, how did that get so clean? Wow, how did that get so clean? You know, um, so he might we might have to bump <coughs> someone. Gonna, okay, so this guy bumped Mateo because I was just like, how is he not in my list? Uh, Travis Parker, he has got to be on the list. It's got to be on the list. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. We came up at like really similar times, and I think maybe like that's why he wasn't on the list. But now he is; mm. he's on the list. Uh, number nine, Gus Engel, pure genius. Number eight, Sean Genovese. Love everything he does. Absolutely love his style of snowboarding. Number seven, possibly, you know, always in the running for goat. Just puts a huge smile on my face. Way too important. In snowboarding, to not mention Terry Hawkinson. Number six, uh, this guy was pretty close to the top of my list for a while. Tadashi Fuse. Wow, love that one. It's just such a like kind of like at one point, like when I was in really chasing, that was the guy I wanted. There was like one guy I wanted to be. There's not like very many people I've ever like wanted to be in snowboarding. I'm too like think i'm too good to want to be someone else you know like but th- i really was like i wish i was like tadashi he's so sick he could do it all and he does it with great style number five uh, mark landrick we're talking power goofy footers right now dude. alaska too alaska point yeah and just yeah, lando so much just explosive number four scott stevens okay this is all of these numbers need to change because I just don't have a number two on here. It's fine. 
Oh, so they are. It is a top ten list. This is a top ten. So Kuzik's ten. So, so Scott was three. Scott's three. Got it. Number two used to be number one, but he's just down one place. Mark Frank Montoya. Wow. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> great much. answer. Yeah. Yeah, I love MFM, dude. Like black box on. You know, just like the if you can just air and just be the dude, and all you you just aired. You didn't grab. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. You just aired. It's a good gig right there. Like, everything's swirling around you in the world, and you aired, and it was better. That's special. That is special. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, sidebar, got to got to uh, interrupt for a second and say we went to the cabin while filming for Greenberg, and we had everybody write their desired nickname on the cup, and uh, what was yours? <laughs> well, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, you wrote that on there. The, uh, people were saying I was the MFM on one footers, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have a soft spot for like a soft spot for just like the gangster vibe too. Dude. Like I just, I just still love it. You know, I love it like when a writer comes out and has a little bit of that, especially these days. You it's know? pretty sweet. Yeah, and uh, yeah, MFM, amazing. Okay, my number one, number one at this date, favorite all time snowboarder. Freddie Perry. <laughs> wow. Curveball. <laughs> really? Curveball. I thought like maybe Peter Lyon was coming or something like Goofy Footer. I don't know. Yeah. I just, I love it though. Freddie love Peter P. Lyon. I love it. Yeah. Freddie, dude. Like there isn't like, this guy can't miss. Just 100% can't miss for me. Like everything he does puts a smile on my face. Like favorite guy to watch snowboard and just. Live, I, 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 I kind of just want like a live stream on Freddy, like at all times. The Truman Show type of situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, so that was a very well thought out, yeah, list. Yeah, I well, I say. will like sometimes on when I'm bored, you know, pull this up and just kind of like dink around on it, dink around, move some peeps around, see if get people, some fresh yeah. faces on there. Exactly, <laughs> like Mateo, you'll you'll get back there, buddy. Uh, okay, so. We got a couple things here that we got to talk about. Uh, hot takes. So we kind of just covered this, but we're going to do what we always do. First question we're going to ask is MJ of snowboarding and or goat to you, uh, both male and female, who you got? Well, since I started, did my top 10, I'm just going to go like objective goats. And uh, I think uh, Barrett Christie's the goat for women snowboarding. Actually... Mateo and I had this conversation the other day and he kind of convinced me into this opinion. So, but I was already there, but he really convinced me. But Mateo, who used to be on your list? <laughs> yeah. Same one? Okay, yeah. Just yeah. making sure. Okay. <laughs> it's the same one. Yeah. Used to be on the list, Mateo. Maybe yep. you heard of him. Used to be top 10. <laughs> had a brief run on the top 10. Very brief. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, Barrett's just, she's won so much and she invented tricks and she was really just like so out front in the lead, on leading for such a long time. And she's awesome. Okay, dude. Dude, I'm going to give it to Travis Rice. Good um, answer. Yeah. Solid. I mean, dude, no one's done more for, no one's done more for the culture of snowboarding that I consider to be the culture of snowboarding. And um, no one has taken that many projects to places that no one thought imaginable, including standalone tricks, movies, video parts, like, and the contest. And, like, everything he he does, he, like, sends it to a place that you didn't even know you could send it to. There's a transition out there that only he can see that no one else is looking at, and he's aiming for it. You know, it's like... Goat. It's a bit of a cow, cow is fat time to slaughter scenario, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Facts. Um, okay. So next one, most underrated. Who you got? Mark Thompson. That's your final answer? Yeah. Mark Thompson. Great answer. Uh, steel or powder? Powder. Nice. Best style ever. Who you got? Freddie. Freddie Perry? Yeah. His style's so good, it hurts him. He has no defense mechanisms. He gets on like the gnarliest thing, like just doing absolutely nothing with 
the arms are like, there's no like, no self preservation involved. <laughs> and it shines through. <laughs> Never look at style that way. I love that dissection of it. Best video ever made. Cavolution. Cavolution? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good answer. Dude, Cavolution with the kayak, with the throwing water buckets on his face. Like Lando <laughs> and I would just trip out over that. Some bangers in there. Uh, best board graphic ever made. Genevieve's Bernie graphic. With like the naked man laying there. Super creepy. Solid. <laughs> okay, pants over or under high back? Definitely under. Yeah. <laughs> That is a stupid question. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. under. Okay, uh, if you go heliboarding with three people, who are you taking? I'm going to go heliboarding with... I'm definitely taking Pika heliboarding. And I'm just going to take uh, my brother Garrett and childhood friend Brett Connor. Brett Connor in the heli. Okay, the beaver slap in the lift line. You hit that thing? What's your take? So this has been sort of an interesting one that I haven't really been able to like fully understand. So you're just talking about just slapping your tail while you're yeah. slapping a bitch. Yeah, dude, yeah. have you seen my board? I mean, you see how many crab grabs I'm running, dude? Yeah. I'm beaver slapping. Yeah, you are. You're I can't be taking beef. that much extra snow you're slapping. with me, you know? Okay, so All you're pro beaves. I'm pro beaves, beaves yeah. Okay. okay, worst trend. What do you got? One footers. <laughs> <laughs> Great cool answer. answer. Cool answer. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, we've been doing the damn thing. Uh, a couple more things. Setups. Talk. You want to talk us through your setup real quick? How you set up your board, bindings, all that stuff. So yeah, I just set my board up. I close my eyes. Um, I open the box and I just shake it out and wherever it lands, I just get that stance running. Cool technique. <laughs> yeah, Twenty six inches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just um, yeah. I'm riding the fifty four box scratcher and I've got. Um, my bit metal bindings that Jino did the art on, the logics, and they're both pretty soft. I guess I'm sort of like a, I like a little play when I'm coming into stuff. Like I don't want too much reaction. I just um, I like a little bit of give, uh, not too reactionary, and um, I still dull the edges a little bit. But the magnet traction keeps me good. So I ride this board all year and on everything, really. I didn't ride any other board, any other board this year. So, um, and then uh, my stance, I don't know, what does that look like to you? 23? 29, 30? 29, 30, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. 30 in stance. <laughs> <laughs> Looks yeah, like a stance. Yeah, uh, it's, it's close. I've been in stance territory before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a tendency to drift, you know, but yeah. I definitely am not going tight with it. I'm keeping it pretty, pretty out there. Like, Keep it I think OG. it's like 23. It could be 23 and a half. A That's OG. Stance. And then for my knee stuff, like I, I've taken some angles down, so I'm not super angled anymore, but, but I'm still running like 15 and probably negative nine. Solid. Okay. Well, that's a good, um, good setup breakdown. Now, Last but not least, we got to ask, uh, do you want to throw any thank yous? Uh, dude, I want to thank you guys. Woo. Thanks, yeah, Carter. because this is so cool um, that you guys did this. And, like, it's so awesome to have you as, like, a big place in the media landscape these days. And I feel like everyone's just been like, what's going on in the world? Like, you know, magazines come and go and stuff's happening. And it's like so much change in our culture that I think it's really important time for you guys to be rising up and doing what you're doing. And it feels awesome that it's you and you doing it, dude. It's so cool. So thank you guys. And then, um, and then other than that, just all glory to Pika. <laughs> no, but, uh, I just really, you know, want to thank my wife, Christina Bertner for everything she's done over the years and currently, and my son, Ollie, because I love our little family. And that's it. Incredible. Yeah. Well, it's been an incredible chat. Uh, thanks for inspiring and bringing up so many people with you and doing so much for the snowboard community, Jesse. We really appreciate you and what you've done. And uh, I want to say thank you to all of our listeners, everybody that tunes in. You guys rule all of our sponsors, all of our Patreon members. Thank you guys so much. And uh, with that being said, 
We will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.